Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Mitch Wade Cole here, and this is my first podcast for Fred, and really happy to do this. The premise of the podcast is called Easy Journey to Other Planets. The idea behind the podcast is, so I was out in London town with some friends, and we were getting the the old tube back, and uh, we all parted ways at uh, Bling's Cross, which is uh, what I call King's Cross, and then I'm on the train alone. I looked down next to me and a magical shaman appeared in the form of a a book called Easy Journey to Other Planets. And the book, the cover of it is some guy meditating spiritually. He's got some energy going all the way through his body. And then he's like thinking about some some kind of chick and some blue dude with a... of reefs and flowers around the outside it really really caught my eye um especially as it was the only thing in the train at the time you know even all the even in standards have been taken away by that point it must have been about 11 half 11 uh this was the only reading material and i thought you know what i'm not into these kind of mystical spiritual things naturally but maybe me reading this book with you guys us reading it together we could both become extremely spiritual we're gonna work it out along the way i'm quite cynical so while i'm reading it i'm gonna try and keep an open mind keep an open mind and then kind of give you my thoughts on what is happening uh what i'm reading my honest thoughts and then hopefully by the end of the book we'll both be indoctrinated and we can go for a bit of a yoga session how does that sound Hit me up on Facebook, uh, Mitch Wade Cole, uh, Instagram, Mitch Wade Cole, got a Facebook page, MWCFP, because I stupidly claimed the, the Facebook URL for my personal profile, and yeah, it's a very convoluted world I live in. Hopefully this book is going to sort everything right out. Now, where do you start with a book like this? Where where do you go? Uh, when you get a book, um, what do you do? Do you read the blurb first? Some mentalists out there dive right in without even reading the blurb. Can you imagine that? What kind of... There are some crazy people out there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, people that don't read the blurb and um, just dive right into a book. They're just like, I don't care. I'm going off piste. I'm just going to dive right in. I'm not even going to read the title. I just like the picture on the front. I'm going to go straight in. But I'm, we're going to start with the blurb. So that's the synopsis of the podcast. This is what we're doing. Um... When I begin to read the book, what will happen is there's going to be music in the background and maybe add a bit of reverb to my voice so you can tell when it is I'm reading the book and when I'm uh, critiquing what I'm reading. Uh, So it should add a little bit of a, yeah, kind of a a duality there, a dimension so you can can separate it so it makes it a bit easier to understand. And I really, really, really apologise in advance for... um, mispronouncing any names in this book and the and the um the author's name and i'll try and make any corrections i can um along the way okay so let's dive right in this is easy journey to other planets and by his divine grace ac bhaktivedanata swami prabhu prabhu bada and uh, he's the founder of Akira of the International Society for Krish- Krishna Consciousness, which I- I'm sure we're going to find out all about it in here. I don't know what that is. I've heard about Krishnas and Hare Krishnas before, but okay, let's rock this. It's even got an ISBN number, so you know it's a proper book. Um, cool. People dream of traveling to the stars, but such travel is still far away. Ancient yoga traditions, however, describe subtle pathways by which yo- master yogis transfer themselves to planets beyond the Earth. Easy Journey to Other Planets introduces readers to those worlds, especially to the eternal world that lies beyond in the anti-material sky. Anyone who, by practicing Bhakti Yoga, turns the mind from the material to the spiritual can easily attain the world beyond the reach of birth, death, old age, and disease. The four states of man. Birth, death, old age, and disease. So, you know what? You could have gone on Ryanair.com and got yourself a cheap flight somewhere to some sort of holiday destination, Europe, uh, Canada, I don't know where Ryanair goes. It goes all over the place. And you've stumbled upon this podcast and got the cheapest way to go on a holiday ever. How amazing is that? I am... Hoping to translate these words, and this guy, you know, 
take you on a journey that you couldn't even pay for. So hopefully we're going to be going on some real good missions together, some journeys, some holidays or what, you know, whatever you want to call them. And, um, and I'm really excited to take you there. And there's a bit of information about his divine grace here. I'll, I'll read that now. His divine grace, AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhu, Prabhupada, was a teacher in the discipline line from Krishna and was an exemplar in Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of devotion and mysticism. His translations and commentaries are guided by a lifetime of scholarship and enriched by the realizations of a mature practitioner. So <clears throat> one thing about this, and this is not even from a skeptical way, because however you live your life, whether you're a scientist or whether you're religious, whatever, I mean, at the end of the day, you're just trying to get through your life. You know, um, some people find comfort in facts and some people find comfort in spirituality. So, you know, whatever it is you believe in or however, however you've devoted yourself, and if you're changing people's lives and helping people's lives and teaching them things, you know, where's the, where's the harm in that? I mean, it sounds great. And... He gives people free holidays um, through um, through mysticism. He allows us to travel beyond birth, death, old age, and disease. This guy is a giver, and you should see he's smiling. Like, when do you ever see... Actually, you know what? I think most religious people I see are always smiling. I don't know what they're smiling about. Um, maybe they don't in Catholicism, in the confession booth, but... You can't really see... You can't really see the person you're confessing to in that kind of situation. They, they probably... They could be smiling. That's that's one of the that's a problem, you know. So I'm going to open the book now at the first page, and it says "Easy Journey to Other Planets," and then again after the, on the second page, "Easy Journey to Other Planets," dedicated to the scientists of the world with blessings of His Divine Grace, my spiritual master. And this is going to be an absolutely awful, abhorrent. Um, pronunciation of this of this person's name Sri Srimad Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati Goswami Maharaja my spiritual master I love it how he dedicates it to the scientists of the world because I think they're the two dualities so you've got this spiritual world of um my guy doing yoga and he's like you know taking on spiritual journeys and letting yourself be free and then you've got these very cynical scientific types that are like no mate that's bullshit get the get out of here mate i'm a scientist this is what scientists sound like by the way i'm a scientist and um i'm telling you right now right now whatever you're doing there is cods wallop it is serious cods wallop you might as well just go wallop a bloody cod on your head you're mental i saw him be walloping you in the head with a cod because i tell you what you are bloody silly doing all that yoga stuff i go jogging Jogging is scientifically proven to really release energy and get you in a meditative state. Well, this whole yoga thing, you're barely moving. Uh, so that's my scientist impression there. But that's that's the thing. So And then his divine grace will go, you know what, don't worry, scientists. You believe what you want to believe and and I'll I'll forgive you. Oh, okay, that's Christianity. I don't know what these guys do. Okay, let's, so let's get really stuck in here. So we've got the preface. And hopefully we're going to be really finding some some real gems in here we're going to work out this is going to really give us the basis for this podcast and the way it's going to go so a living being especially civilized man has a nat natural desire to live forever in happiness you know what he's true that's true you know we, we all want to be happy don't we but i think in british culture we do really 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 like something to complain about we love you know people do love a bit of bitterness they love to have something to complain about whether it's they love it but they can obsess by it and then scratching that itch of complaining or um being annoyed at something does somehow release some pleasure in them like as if they're solving a problem potentially this is quite natural because in his original state, the living being is both eternal and joyful. So he said his, so that's, you know, um, fair enough. I mean, he could have been in their uh, natural state, especially in this whole world of pronouns that we're living in at the moment with the he's and the she's and the days. And we want to be more inclusive. He could have uh, hit us with a, with a they uh, rather than a he or a she. This is quite natural because in his original state, the living being is both eternal and joyful. Also, he's very matter of fact there. He's not saying, well, possibly they might be or they're not. He's like, oh yeah, they are. 
Oh, wait, 100. 100. 110. However, in the present conditioned state of life, he is enraged in a struggle against recurring birth and death. Therefore, he has attained neither happiness nor immortality. Oh, okay, we started off quite, you know, quite straightforward and following it. A living being, especially civilized man, has a neutral desire to live forever in happiness. But then he just really took a dive in there, you know. Um, however, in his preconditioned state of life, so that I, I imagine he would be talking about me. I mean, you know, he's he's talking about me indirectly. He's doing, give me a little indirect uh, drama tweet there. Um, he is enraged in a struggle f against reoccurring birth and death. So I was like, okay, yeah, I am engaged in a struggle. And it's against reoccurring birth and death. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. well, recurring birth and death. I, I, well, I didn't really think about it like that, to be honest with you. You've kind of... And, uh, yeah, actually, that was probably the furthest thing away from my mind in terms of what I imagine my struggle might be. Mostly salary-based struggles is well, maybe that you know um, you're born and then you earn a salary and then you die. I, you know, maybe there is some logic there. Therefore, he has attained neither happiness nor immortality. So, because I am in an eternal struggle between birth and death, I have neither achieved happiness or immortality i mean i don't really know if i want to achieve immortality i mean it's good to you know burn out than fade away or not fade away it's better to just burn out you know um happiness you know i'm quite a content person in myself I mean, obviously i feel like i could be more happy but that's you know maybe that's the kind of driving motivational force of aspiration who knows um i am really i'm waxing lyrical now i'm neither a scientist or a shaman so Okay, I'm going to try and read a good little chunk of it here and then we can go back on it. The latest desire man has developed is the desire to travel to other planets. Okay. <laughs> oh, that, that is true. That is true. This is also quite natural because he has the constitutional right to go to any part of the material or spiritual skies. Such travel is very tempting and exciting because their skies because these guys are full of unlimited globes of varying qualities and they are occupied by all living uh, all types of living entities so uh he's right okay he's correct there the latest desire of man has developed uh, to travel to other planets. And you know, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Elon Musk. I, I think he's cool. Maybe, you know, he's messed up a little bit there and he's a bit uh, paradoxical or, he, well, you know, I say that that's probably the wrong word. He's more of a, uh, a, you know, he likes to parody, he likes a bit of meme and he likes to joke about it. And people, obviously, because of his huge platform and his um, place in the world, take him very seriously or at least pretend to, to sell more uh, and revenue on their websites. I don't know. Maybe, I'm, I give him the benefit of doubt a lot of the time, but you know maybe he is problematic, uh, which is a word that I don't usually use. Uh, so, but then he takes another big leap of faith, as a, as I might say, because he has the constitutional right, whatever that is. And I thought constitution was definitely not a spiritual thing. I thought it was definitely a written down man-made thing. Um, to go to any part of the material, okay, we're talking about planets now, all spiritual skies. So. That's a new thing for me as well. I thought there was only material skies, but also there is um, there is a spiritual sky. Does it occupy the same plane? Let's find out. Such travel is very tempting and exciting because these skies are full of unlimited globes of varying qualities, and they are occupied by all types of living entities. The desire to travel there can be fulfilled by the process of yoga which serves as a means by which one can transfer himself to whatever planet he likes. Possibly to planets where life is not only eternal and blissful, but where there are multiple varieties of enjoyable energies. Anyone can attain the freedom of the spiritual planets need never return to this miserable land of birth, old age, disease and death. So, the anchor point, it seems, based on the blurb and the preface, is the birth, old age, disease, and death. That they are the four things that we experience. It seems. Although, I mean, can you die without disease? And you can also die without old age. You can't die without birth, and you can't die without death. I mean, the old age and disease are, are probably elements of fear uh, that will go oh yeah old age we all fear about old age potentially oh disease we all feel about disease and we all feel about death so maybe these are kind of like anchor points to really get into your emotional state 
so he also mentions here um, which one can travel himself to whatever planet he likes possibly planets where life is not only eternal and blissful which which sounds great maybe he's talking about a sort, a sort of heaven I mean it can be it's not eternal here but it can be blissful for some um, and there are multiple varieties of any of enjoyable energies so that he, you know he, I think he, when he says enjoyable energies I think people that are more spiritual understand energies or they feel energies and they you know they understand when people talk about energies I mean to me it's a very broad uh, concept it's like you know man you, you got a really great energy about you man and like you know I guess you know people do have um, a kind of kinetic vibe you know you got the thing uh, in science the mirror neuron uh, the mirror neuron is actually uh, something that they have discovered and it's it's a little bit like meerkats. Uh, so when one meerkat jumps up to signify there's some sort of danger that he may have seen, all the other meerkats stand up at the same time and it's like a weird kind of, um, uh, almost like a sense, but when someone is on the stage, for example, uh, like a rock star and they're like maybe singing a really emotional song, that mirror in our own wit it's supposed to reflect on the person watching so if someone's angry you know you can feel anger and and maybe it's part of our group thing or you know there's definitely um you know crowd mentalities and you know it's possibly something to do with that i feel like i'm the guy writing this book now you know i'm just but definitely check out a few things like mirror neurons and stuff i think you'd be quite interested in that So next, um, so still on the preface. One can attain the stage of perfection very easily by his individual effort. Oh, that's nice. He can simply follow in his own home the prescribed method of bhakti yoga. This method under proper guidance is simple and enjoyable. An attempt is made herein to give information to people in general and to philosophers and religionists in particular as to how one can transfer oneself to other planets by this process of bhakti yoga the highest of all yoga processes so I, i've tried out yoga a couple of times before never properly never at a proper class um always just at a festival you know you've been drinking the day four and then um there'll be some person who practices it and they share a bit of the you know the moves you gotta do and you follow them and it was great, man. It was really peaceful. It was nice breathing. It did feel good. Um, really, like, you know, I can talk positively of that experience. Um, I, did I travel to other planets? No. But he's saying, he's going, yeah, yoga's good. Yoga's pretty sweet. But my yoga's the best one. You can go to other planets with my yoga. So get on board with some back to yoga, the highest of your yogic processes. So it's like, oh, that's quite funny. So you got like uh, logic, uh, maybe that scientists use and stuff like that. And then you got yogic that spiritual people use, which is a form of, you know, maybe in the world of yoga, a form of logic, you know, it's the yo yoga yogic, yogic. Um, I know about yogurt. Now that is bliss on earth. I'll tell you about that. And now we've made it, ladies and gentlemen. We've made it all the way through to chapter one. And this is, I feel, where where the real meat and potatoes... I mean, uh, shouldn't have said that. Uh, lentils and couscous of the book is. And we're going to really dive in right now into the chapter one, known as Anti-Material Worlds. Materialistic science may one day finally discover the eternal anti-material world, which has for so long been unknown to the wranglers of gross materialism. The, the first thing that comes to my mind when we say wranglers of gross materialism is, is wranglers genes. Now, wranglers genes are, are gross material and... Uh, yeah, unknown to the wranglers of gross materialism, the people that that make wranglers and wear wranglers are also uh, the 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 grossness of that material is also unknown to them. So, if you do approach anyone down the street, um, recommend them this podcast and point them to about wherever we are, about twenty minutes in, and uh, let them have a read of that with their ears. Regarding the scientist's present conception of antimatter. The Times of India published the following news release. 
Stockholm, October the 26th, 1959. Two American atomic scientists were awarded the 1959 Nobel Physics Prize today for the discovery of the antiproton, proving that matter exists in two forms, as particles and antiparticles. They are Italian-born Dr. Emilio Segre, 69, and Dr. Owen Chamberlain, born in San Francisco. According to one of the fundamental assumptions of the new theory, there may exist another world, or an anti-world, built up of antimatter. This, this anti-material world would consist of atomic and subatomic, subatomic particles spinning in reverse orbits to those of the world we know. If these two worlds should ever clash, they would both be annihilated in one blinding flash, one blinding flash. Whoa, okay, all right. Don't know about you, but I almost uh, sh myself there. Um, it started off good, it started off exciting. They, they've discovered this anti-proton. Uh, which which is it, it doesn't prove that this guy's anti-material yoga world exists let's be honest but it creates a gap in our knowledge um, which potentially could be filled with the practices of yoga and also you know it's it's innocent until proven guilty so I'm not saying this guy's guilty or anything he's not on trial I'm just trying to get my own understanding of this so the anti-proton world, which is a whole gap in our understanding of what of reality, which where a whole of reality could exist, um, could be filled with his um, practices of science. So the anti-world, which I love, I love that word. That's a great word, anti-world, and uh, uh, with a hyphen and anti-matter. The anti-material world would consist of atomic and subatomic poles. Now, the fear of God thrown into you here with the if these two worlds should ever clash. They would both be annihilated in one blinding flash. Well, that's that's a good bar, actually. Uh, so on that on that point, um, he's making out like if they ever clashed, they were like I, I always thought they were they probably they already have clashed. They they are existing in the same world because the antimatter and the matter are here. But maybe they're maybe it's some sort of flip, like I don't know the other side of a mirror or something like that. Maybe it's uh, maybe they're not maybe they're not. It's not just like a, an opposite, an anantioma, an, an opposite of just your normal particles, and there just has to exist an opposite. There is another world. But what if they got together and there was just a massive party? Do you know what I mean? It'd be like, yo, it's like, your, it's like when your cousins come over, you know, the cousins that you like. Your cousins come over, you're like, yo, this is my antimatter. It's not even antimatter, it's just cousin matter. That's what they should call it. It's cousin matter. Uh, we're having a cousin business right now. And um, yeah bringing your cousins over we could have a party it might not be a blinding flash it might be a blinding bash a big cousin bash get your cousins over and we're gonna have a bloody great one having a drink you know that one cousin you don't really like that much is over there if any of my cousins are listening to this i love uh, i think you're all pretty cool uh but you know uh it could be one uh, you know second cousin oh he's that i don't even know him he's, he's not even got the same surname as me and uh he's not even he's not even really related <laughs> But it could be like that. I mean, let's think positive here. Let's think positive. So in this statement, the following propositions are put forward. There is an antimaterial atom or particle which is made of the anti-qualities of material atoms. Whoa, okay, I've heard of double negatives before, but that one is a real neg twister, that. Hey, there is an antimaterial atom or particle which is made up of anti-qualities of material atoms. So, uh, so anti-material, made up of anti-qualities of material atoms. Okay, I think he just, just a mic gets it right at the end there. So, it's a single negative, but two negatives uh, parallel with each other, I feel. Number two. There is another world besides this material world of which we have only limited experience. So what he's doing here is he's got a scientific study who, and the scientists themselves are saying there is another world out there. The scientists have said it themselves. Anti-proton world. They've said it. We haven't said it. So there, there it is. Scientific proof there is another world out there. Number three. The antimaterial and material worlds may clash at a certain period and may annihilate one another. 
Yeah, well, we talked about this. I mean, you know, sometimes cousins clash. Sometimes cousins clash and have a have a bit of a fisticuffs. But you know, your family in the end of the day, you can't really. It's nothing really you can do. You can't choose your family. Can you choose your anti-material world? Probably not either. I mean, it's there. It's ready to clash. It's ready to bash. It's ready to flash. Okay, let's continue on of our journey into the anti-material worlds. Out of these three items, we, the students of theistic science, theist, that's, that's like an anti-matter, material, anti-material thing, isn't it? Aren't they two, two opposing factors? I know you get doctors in theism and theologianism and stuff, but maybe not, not doctors of science in theism as far as I'm aware, can fully agree with items one and two. <laughs> so they, so uh, we as students of science can definitely agree that there is another world out there. That's fair, I suppose so, because I guess we, we are thinking there are di parallel dimensions in bubbles and the bubbles are going and, you know, string theory was a thing for a bit, but apparently that's not actually a thing anymore. Um, please, yeah, check my um, podcast on string theory. It doesn't exist yet, but in a, in an alternative reality possibly does so if you can find it let me know <sighs> the difficulty lies in the fact that the scientists conception of antimatter extends only to another variety of material energy oh i'm gonna go back there a second so we can agree um we can fully agree with items one or two, but we can't can agree with item three only within the limited scientific definition of antimatter. Okay, um, and that was the worlds clashing and annihilating each other. So he's he's taking back that third point of where it's like a very um, apocalyptic. The difficulty lies in the fact that the scientist's conception of antimatter extends only to another variety of material energy. Whereas the real antimatter must be entirely antimaterial. So we're really getting conflated with what this antimaterial antimatter thing is here. Matter, as it is con constituted, must be entirely antimaterial. Matter, as it is constituted, is subjected to annihilation. Uh, but antimatter, if it is to be free from all material symptoms, must also be free from annihilation by its very nature. What? what? You've already you said you, you said also, but also what? Because you said matter isn't subject. Uh, oh, matter is subject to annihilation, and an antimatter is free from material symptoms. Must also be free from annihilation. So you said one is is gonna get annihilated and the other one's free from it also anyway if matter is destructible or separable antimatter must be indestructible and inseparable we shall try to discuss these propositions from the angle of authentic scriptural vision uh, so here we go so he's saying that our world is bound to annihilation we're in a world of matter we're in a physical world uh, and in this physical world, things can get broken and annihilated. You know, there's war, there's explosions, uh, there's uh, the decay of rocks uh, against the sea, and the riverbeds are, you know, a form of decay of the earth, creating snaked rivers all the way to the oceans, and you know that kind of thing, and earthquakes, and continental drift, and mountain formation, and island formation. You know, it's all destruction. Okay, that's something we can totally agree on because that is a form of matter. Whereas the antimatter, because it's the opposite, and we're completely destructible, is completely indestructible. And so it's this world of indestructibility that can never be destroyed, uh, which is why possibly it allows you to live forever. Um, he's going to discuss that world that we don't actually really know about um, and have no proof of knowing it through authentic scriptural visions which i imagine are people having visions and write writing it down in scriptures which is just as much as maybe you know me having a cup of tea and tripping out and kind of making up my own idea of what the world is but obviously this has been practiced for years and years and it's it's more of a cultural thing um with a lot of writing and practice and and time spent on it 
you know, me just drinking a cup of tea and having a few visions, you know, people wouldn't really take me that seriously, to be honest with you. I mean, when I usually do it and I make a weird video, people don't really take me that seriously. Actually, hopefully if I read this book, maybe people might take me more seriously. That's... Yeah, good one. Good one, um, Master Sensei. Good one. Okay, so here we go. We're going to look at the authentic scriptural visions. Just having a sip of uh, mystical Ribena there. The most wild, widely recognized scriptures in the world are the Vedas. The, the Vedas have been divided into four parts. Sama, Yajur, Aji, and Atharva. A-T-H-A-R-V-A. The subject matter of the Vedas is very difficult for a man of ordinary understanding. For elucidation, the four Vedas are explained in the historical epic called the Mahabharata and in 18 Puranas. The Ramayana is also a historical epic which contains all the necessary information from the Vedas. So the four Vedas, the original Ramayana by Valmiki, the Mahabharata and the Puranas are classified as Vedic literatures so it seems like there's four epic books with all the answers to everything um in them explained with i guess with allegory and metaphors which you know that's that's happened for many years um homer's odyssey and you know plato he wrote a few books um shakespeare uh he wrote like a lot of uh, morals and stories into his into his stories and books. Uh, Quentin Tarantino, he, you know, he's he's basically like a modern day version. As long as they, you know, the tape doesn't decay and we can keep him going for four thousand years, people will look back at it and go, right, it was all there in front of us this whole time. The Upanishads are parts of the four Vedas and the Vedanta Sutras represent the cream of the Vedas, like the real top shit. To summarize all these Vedic literatures, the Bhagadarava Gwa is accepted as the essence of all Upanishads, Upanishads and the preliminary explanation of the Vedanta Sutra. One may then conclude that from the Bhagavad Gita, alone one can have the essence of the Vedas for it is spoken by Lord Sri Krishna the supreme personality of Godhead who descends upon this material world from the anti-material world in order to give complete information of the superior form of energy so what he's saying is just hitting my uh, my mystical vape here so what he's saying is um there's four of these things he's kind of explain what four of these books are um the spiritual uh, scriptures but the the best stuff you're gonna get out of the four is from this one book and um the uh the vedanta sutra and that is that that's the highest quality spiritual book you're gonna read that's the real high grade stuff that's your uh that's your OG Kush, you know what I mean? You don't want to read the other stuff. The other stuff's like tie stick or something like that. Which, you know, which tie stick's fine sometimes. Tie stick is fine if you just want to have a, just a chilled out, relaxing smell, you know. Bit of a, bit of soap, soap bar, you know. Uh, but uh, what you could be doing is you could be, you could be smoking some of that OG Kush and really getting dank up in this business. And um, Lord Sri Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, is going to be the one who's going to be taking you there. He's going to be like, e ease the split, roll him up, mate, and just spark him up and get yourself off to Mars, man. That's what I do every day. That's what I do every night. Um, by the way, actually, just to confirm for the record there, I don't even actually smoke weed, so um, I'm just I'm just like this normally. So the he, he's the supreme personality of Godhead. So I don't know what Godhead is, but, I mean, it sounds... Pretty cool. I mean, if if I met someone on LinkedIn and they were like, "Oh, you're right, mate. Uh, how's it going? I'm Mitch. You know, I work. Um, you know, I work. I'm not going to tell you what I do for a living. Um, it's pretty fun." He'll say, um, "I don't do this for a living." Uh, he'll say, "Yeah, I'll, 
hey man, Krishna, I'm Supreme Personality of Godhead. I'll be like, oh, right, Godhead, is that, um, what is that a new start up down at Shoreditch uh, High Street? And he'd be like, no, no, I know it's just who I am. I am the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So what is a Supreme Personality? Is it like a personal assistant that they've really gone in on? Um, you know, a new type of job? No, no, none of that. Um, can you just leave now? You're really, really messing with my energy. I don't. I think you've got a really bad energy. You ask too many questions. Is what he would be saying to me. So um, he gives the complete information of the superior form of energy. So the superior form of energy, I hear you ask, of the personality of Godhead is described in the Bhagavad Gita as Parapraktri. Parapraktri. The scientists have recently discovered that there are two forms of perishable matter, but the Bhagavad Gita describes most perfectly the concept of matter and antimatter in terms of two forms of energy. Matter is energy. Matter is an energy which creates the material world, and the same energy in its superior form also creates the anti-material transcendental world. So what he's saying here is um, they've discovered there's two types of power. Or, or the book that's been around for thousands of years said there was two types of ma- power and scientists have found it recently. He's also saying that the r- world we're in right now, the material world, is pretty good. Um, it's, a, it's an energy. However, anti-material is its superior form. So realistic, we, you know, Earth is great and everything and where we are is cool and the Milky Way is brilliant. But... What we really want to be doing is we want to get into that anti-material world because that's where the that's the OG Kush really. That's where we're going to be, you know, puffing those pipes of the really good squidgy black and that. So um, let's carry on. Let's carry on delving in. The living entities belong to the category of superior energy. The inferior energy or material energy is called apparapractory. In the Bhag- Bhagavad. Gita, I really need to research how these are pronounced. The creative energy is thus presented in two forms, namely apara and pa- para. Prakriti, prakriti, pra- prakriti. Really sorry for this. So, um, so we've only just recently discovered, for scientific fact, that there are two types of energies, and matter and antimatter. Whereas these guys have been on it for time, man. They've been on it for time. They've been saying it for ages. It's like finally the whole world's caught up with our two opposing energies. So, matter itself has no creative power. When it is manipulated by the living energy, material things are produced. Matter in its crude form is therefore the latent energy of the Supreme Being. Whenever we think of energy, it is natural that we think of the source of energy. For example, when we think of electrical energy, we simultaneously think of the powerhouse where it is generated. (laughs) So... There's a lot to take in there. So, Mario itself has no creative power. So, he's saying uh, something that's not living, you know, you got a bloody rock, you got a uh, wood, you know, not a tree, like, so woods are, so rock, uh, basically just rocks. Uh, when you've got a rock, it doesn't do anything on its own. It's just going to sit there. It's going to um, chill out, you know, I guess, the elements, the wind and the rain, carve it. You, could, could you say that, a mountain is a natural piece of art because it's been carved by the elements. Well, you know, maybe it's art specific to man. You know, does it, does it have to be living energy? But I guess that's how we assume art is. Have you just joined us, by the way? Uh, we're reading for a book called Easy Journey to Other Planets, and this show is called Easy Journey to Other Planets. Uh, I'm Mitch Wade Cole, and uh, we're just re- walking through it, and we're we're trying to take an objective look at this book that I found on the tube. Uh, called Easy Journey to Other Planets, and we're in Chapter 1, Anti-Material Worlds. So, so far we found out that there are two types of energy, matter and antimatter. In the antimatter world, it's created a gulf in our understanding where we don't actually know 
um, what is in the antimaterial world and it's uh, and these guys have got an explanation of what they think it possibly is and uh, there's teachings and scriptures from thousands of years ago uh, I'm assuming actually because they haven't actually said how long the, how old these um, particular scriptures are and that's where we are okay so Mataria has no creative power when it is manipulated by the living energy so that's probably like me like you when we're imposing our living creatureness on stuff that's when things are created that's creativity matter in its crude form is therefore the latent energy of the supreme being so so he's saying that the rock and that is is energy waiting to be released i'm not sure as the supreme being this person Whenever we think of energy, it is natural that we think of the energy source. For example, when we think of electrical energy, we simultaneously think of the powerhouse where it's generated. Every single time. I can't think of energy without thinking, oh, is that coming from a battery or is that coming from Draco power station in the Midlands? You know, where where is this energy being produced? You know, I guess the um the more calm thinkers not the calm thinkers the more um economically conscious of us do think that kind of stuff you know we do think all oh, right we don't want to be burning coal we don't want to be doing this we want to get it from the wind we want to get it from the waves although you know most i think most energy is from coal to honestly and one of the worst things about it is it doesn't get stored when the coal's burnt it's just a perpetual generation of energy that goes down a grid so, um, so maybe some of us are having this, and pe- maybe the people that relate more to this kind of book and spirituality probably are more energy conscious, and um, you know we don't want to be, you know, I'm not for global warming. We've definitely got got to be doing something. So, it is under the control. So, uh, where the power is generated, energy is not self-sufficient. It is under the control of superior living being. It is under the control of a superior living being. Let's say, imagine. For example, fire is the source of two other energies, namely light and heat. Light and heat have no independent existence outside of fire. They don't. Without fire, like so, light, light and energy don't have an independent existence outside of fire. So without fire, there's no light and there's no heat. It's I think I think we're getting really confused with what possibly fire is here because there's definitely light without fire and there's definitely heat without fire and light. So you know, getting a bit confused at the moment, but I'm giving the benefit now. Let's read another good chunk and get back to it. Light and heat have no independent existence outside of fire. Similarly, the inferior and superior energies are derived from a source which one may call which one may call by any name. That source of energy must be a living being with full sense of of everything. That supreme living being is the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, or the all attractive living being. So he was talking about when he was uh when he's on about this living being and this person, it wasn't talking about me. I thought it was saying that you know, in the hand, the matter in the hands of the living, the, the living being um, would be any living being. But he is the, the they are specifically talking about the Sri Krishna. Um, in the Vedas, the supreme living being or the absolute truth is called Bhagavan, the opulent one. Wait, can I just rewind one second? The all-attractive living being. I really hope this wasn't a person from back in the day that wrote it and it was like, oh, okay, so what about the antimatter and the matter? It's like, you know, that's quite insightful into the future. It's like, mm, what should I call myself? Should I call myself the superior living being? Definitely call myself all-attractive living being, just in case there's any... Uh, ladies reading the scriptures later and then they'll look at my pictures and be like oh where's the where's the all attractive one and we're like i'm in here ladies and he's like uh and they're like oh i can't see you it's quite dark in here it's like no don't start a fire because uh you know we don't want the light and the heat energy to um, go and have their own little world down out there you know I've, I've turned it off for reasons that you will read in the scriptures in the light in your own time just come in here and just you know 
I'm all attractive, okay. So, in the Vedas, the supreme living being or the absolute truth, it's got a lot of names, is called Bhagavan, the opulent one. The living being who is the fountainhead of all energies. The discovery of the two forms of limited energies by the modern scientists is just the beginning of the progress of science. And they must go further to discover the source of the two particles of atoms, which they term material and antimaterial. So here we go, full circle. He is the, f the flow of energy, it comes from him. He is the source. And the discovery of limited energies by the modern scientists is just the beginning of the progress of science. It's just the beginning. So we're only at the beginning of science. We're not even anywhere yet. This That was just the beginning. We're... There's more to come, and he knows about it because he, he's gonna. He already predicted these two antimatter and matter in his own way, and he knows that the next thing is gonna come. So, how can the antimaterial particle be explained? Great question. We have experience with material, material particles or atoms. But we have no experience with antimaterial atoms. However. The Bhagavad Gita gives the following vivid description of the antimaterial particle. This antimaterial particle is within the material body. Because of the presence of this antimaterial particle, the material body is progressively changing from childhood to boyhood, from boyhood to youth to old age. After which, the antimaterial particles leave the old, unworkable body and takes up another material body. So, this is the reincarnation. This is saying, yo, we regress. We change from childhood to boyhood. So, I, I, I guess boyhood is the next step of, and it's very male centric, um, childhood to boyhood or womanhood. Oh, no, to girlhood. Yeah, so childhood to, oh, sorry, so childhood to boyhood. Boyhood to youth, so boy, so childhood is, must be up to the age of five. Boyhood the, to puberty, and then youth, you know, up to the age of um, how old, how old am I? I'm thirty, so probably up to like 30, 35 at least for youth, and then to old age, which okay, maybe we'll go for forty-five. So. Then he says the antimaterial particles leave the old unworkable body, and then that's it. And then so we've got oh, so he's saying we've got a spirit within us, an antimaterial spirit that we can't detect, and we don't know a whole world inside of us that we don't know is there or not. And when we die, when we perish, that leaves the body and takes up a new body. Sweet it's reincarnation. This description of a living body confirms the scientific discovery that energies exist in two forms so there it is it's it's already there the science has already proven it when one of them the antimaterial particle is separated from the material body the latter becomes useless for all purposes oh, oh that's the material because it's it, the material body we've already covered this it's not it doesn't do anything on its own it needs the living energy otherwise it's completely benign god are you following if you are well done and um so when one of them, the antimaterial particle, is separated from the material body, the light becomes useless for all purposes. As such, the material, the antimaterial particle is undoubtedly superior to the material energy. Fair enough. It's a bit more here, a uh, big chunk explaining this a bit more. No one, there should, therefore, should lament for the loss of material energy. All varieties of sense perception in the categories of heat and cold, happiness and distress, are but interactions of material energy which come and go like seasonal changes. The temporary appearance of disappearance and dis the temporary appearance and disappearance of such material interactions confirms that the material body is formed of a material energy inferior to the living force or jiva energy. Any intelligent man who is not disturbed by happiness and distress Understanding that they are different material phases resulting from the interactions of the inferior energy is competent to regain the antimaterial world where life is eternal, full of permanent knowledge and bliss. Wow, so that was a bit of a mouthful there. 
So the temporary appearance and disappearance of such material interactions confirms that the material body is formed of material energy, inferior to the living force or jiva energy. So the living force is called jiva. Any intelligent man who is not disturbed by happiness or distress, um, not disturbed by happiness... Okay, some people are freakily happy, aren't they? You know what I mean? Like, like, oh, he's on the probably wrong side of extremely happy. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, wow, oh, why won't this person stop smiling? You know, like Mike Myers. Mike Myers wasn't wearing a face mask. He was just sort of smirking. Um, yeah, so I guess there is distressing versions of happiness, definitely. Understanding that they are different material phases resulting from the interactions of the inferior energy. Oh, so it's like... Oh, you can't live with it. You can't live with me. You can't live without me. I'm a mixture of antimatter, the divine form of of matter, and you know the old crap stuff that no one really wants. It's pretty, pretty crap on its own. And um, so the antimaterial world is mentioned here, and in additional, and in the antimaterial world is mentioned here, and in addition. Information is given that in the antimaterial world there is no seasonal fluctuation. So, I'm trying to get my head around this one. The material world is mentioned here. Okay, no, the antimaterial world is mentioned here. All right, we're, we're up to date with that. And in addition, information is given that in the antimaterial world there is no seasonal fluctuation. So, in this world, the material world, we have our seasons and you know, they can be stressful. We, you know, at the moment we're in the middle of winter. We're waiting for summer to come. We want to get out there. In the anti-material world, there's no fluctuations. It's steady as a rock. It, you can set your watch, your anti-material watch by it. Everything there is permanent, blissful, and full of knowledge. But when we speak of it as a world, we must remember that it has forms of paraphernalia of various categories beyond our material experiences. The material body is destructible, and as such, it is changeable and temporary. So is the material world, but the anti-material living force is non-destructible, and therefore it is permanent. Experts, expert scientists have thus distinguished the different qualities of the material and anti-material properties, particles, as temporary and permanent, respectively. So, they're saying, they're saying that these matter particles that we've got in the scientific world are destructible. That is as simple as it gets. They are destructible. But the antimatter ones are indestructible. So, I, I'm not sure. Is, um, is antimatter indestructible or is it only indestructible from our side? So, you know, does antimatter interact with, with normal matter and not the other way around? I'm not too sure. So, you know, antimatter might be able to be broken up by other antimatter, but I've never, I, I don't know. Um, it, obviously, it, for it to be detectable, it has to cause decay to something, I imagine. Um, I'm really, you know, I'm not an expert on science or on yoga. That's what I'm trying to learn with you guys here, ladies and gentlemen. We're trying to find that together. So... The discoverers of the two forms of matter have yet to find out the qualities of antimatter, so we've not really found out whether they're destructible or not. But a vivid description is already given in the Bhagavad Gita, as follows. There's already a description there, so scientists haven't got there, but this is what we're going to find out. The scientists can make further research on the basis of this valuable information. So, the antimaterial particle is finer than the finest of material particles. This living force is so powerful that it spreads its influence all over the material body. So it's this anti-material particle is finer than the finest of material particles. This living force is so powerful that it spreads its influence all over the material body. The anti-material particle has immense potency in comparison to the material particle and consequently it cannot be destroyed so don't even bother don't even bother trying to destroy it because it is spreads its material all over your material and cannot be destroyed because it is it, what is it it's like spread it's, it's marmite cannot be destroyed you can't destroy marmite this is maybe it's marmite all right whatever but the, this is but the beginning of the description of the antimaterial particle in the Bhagavad Gita. 
It is further explained as follows. The finest form of the antimaterial particle is encaged within the gross and subtle material bodies. Although the material bodies, both gross and subtle, are subject to destruction, the finer antimaterial particle is essential. One's interest, therefore, should be in this eternal principle. The perfection of science will occur when it is possible for the antimaterial pardon me. The perfection of science will occur when it is possible for the material scientist to know the qualities of the antimaterial particle and liberate it from the association of non-permanent material particles. Such liberation would mark the culmination of scientific progress. So here they're saying um, what really is going to happen is the perfection of science, when it really, really is going to become perfect, the perfect science, is when we're able to uh, distinguish the qualities of antimaterial particles because then that's going to liberate it and then we're going to find out really what the true nature of the universe is because that's one of the gaps in our knowledge the antimaterial universe is a big gap in our knowledge which obviously these, these people have already sort of explained it in their own yoga sense but we are yet to explain it correctly with science because we've never seen it before but we know it's there there is partial truth in the scientist's suggestion that there may exist also another world consisting of antimaterial atoms and that a clash between the material and antimaterial worlds will result in the annihilation of both. Dun, 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 dun. I'm pretty sure he said actually just a moment ago that, um, that the antimatter world can destroy our world, but our world cannot destroy the antimatter world. But hey, this is the scientist speaking now, not the him. There is a clash which, continu which is continually going on. The annihilation of the material particles is taking place at every moment and the non-material particle is striving for liberation. This is explained in the Bhagavad Gita as follows. So he's saying there is an ongoing battle between... So, oh ah, yes, yeah, so and particles are always getting smashed to pieces with radiation and whatever and what that, uh, that potentially liberates... Do you reckon that's why they've built their Large Hadron Collider? Are they just trying to liberate this antimaterial? Maybe they are. Oh my god, it's all coming full circle now. Even more full circle than the Large Hadron Collider. Whee. Which is closed because they're expanding it to get closer to Kita. So, the non-material particle, which is the living entity, influences the material particles to work. This living entity is always indestructible as long as the non-material particle is within the lump of material energy known by the names of gross and subtle bodies. Then, the entity is manifest as a living unit unit, in the continuous clashing between the two particles. The non-material particle is never annihilated. No one can destroy the antimaterial particle at any time, past, present or future. So you can go through to the past, you can go through to the future, you can go to the present uh, where we are now traveling to the future and you can't mess around with this anti-material and that's that's the bottom line as far as i'm uh, aware here don't mess with the anti-material you can mess with it if you want and nothing will happen uh the material world the world that we live in that we cherish so much you know especially in terms of clothes and not being naked and not you know i mean our person itself um that is but a vessel. We, the, I imagine it's going to get to the point where it says the soul is, is antimatter. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. I'm going to stop it there. It's about an hour I've been in here. Um, thank you. We're at page six now. And um, page six, chapter one, Antimaterial Worlds, uh, Easy Journey to Other Planets. And I really can't wait to um, crack into a bit more of this for you. And uh, as you can kind of see it, uh, you know, as you can imagine, it really is it is going to kick off in here. And yeah, very excited to kind of get into this and see where we can get. And uh, let me know what you thought about this. If you liked it or if you disliked it, uh, it's called um, Easy Journey to Other Planet. It's a podcast by Mitch Ray Cole based on a book by His Divine Grace. Uh, you can catch me in all the places Mitch Ray Cole, Facebook.com forward slash Mitch Ray Cole. Instagram, which way call. Yeah, just make sure you hit me up. Let me know what you think. It's always really helpful to get any feedback on anything because at least you know that people are listening. So whether you're listening from the material world or from the anti-material world, please let me know and I will catch you soon. All of the bezies. Bezzy, bye. Uh.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Easy Journey to Other Planets. This is the radio show on Fred's that can take you to another plane, another place. It's uh, officially the world's cheapest holiday because all you have to do is listen to this podcast and it'll transport you to another world. Ryanair won't do that. They'll just transport you to Magaluf and and charge you for it, you know. Okay, it could be quite cheap in the scheme of things, but with their extra baggage and, and you know, all the different kind of hidden charges you can get, it's not worth it. Just stick with this podcast and we're going to be going sky high. But if you've never listened before, let me just explain a little bit about this podcast. I found this book on a train. It's called Easy Journey to Other Planets. And uh, I think it's a it's a book about spiritual med- meditation. It might have something to do with Buddhism and those kind of things. And it's not me just trying to have a laugh and poke fun at this book. I'm, I'm kind of genuinely interested in finding out what it has to say and about these worlds because it's it's easy to mock and uh, poke fun at things um, but really it's best to try and understand what the hell is going on in the world um, in the first episode we delved in to the blurb the introduction and then now we're actually at page number six in material anti anti-material worlds and uh, what happens is um, when I when I start reading the book you'll hear some music and a bit of effects on my voice and then it will go dry just like it is now super dry and um, that's when I'm going to be just talking about what what my understanding is of the book we've only got a few more pages left let's have a look so it's about 60 pages in total I'm hoping to be about 10 podcasts uh, or radio shows depending on if you listen to it on SoundCloud or wherever you listen to it live okay so you know what we're going to dive right in here and we're at anti-material worlds what we've learnt so far is that there is the real world which is just completely boring and not very fun and all that kind of stuff and then you've got the anti-material world where everything is possible uh, and according to the book scientists have already proved that there's an anti-world you know with anti-matter and stuff like that so it's already there but these guys have known about it for centuries so let's get rocking with anti-material worlds the material body is destructible And as such, it is changeable and temporary. So is the material world. But the anti-material living force is non-destructible and therefore it is permanent. Expert scientists have thus distinguished the different qualities of the material and anti-material particles as temporary and permanent respectively. Okay, so he's diving right in here. He's saying that experts have already laid this kind of thing out. The material world is destructible. It's it's temporary. It's not, you know it's not worth setting your watch to. It could blow up at any minute. It can change at any minute. It's unpredictable. But the anti-material world is non-destructible, and it's going to stay like that forever, which is you know which is good. That's good. That's a good crack. That is you know. You don't want stuff to change all the time. Things changing is boring, you know. We want to be like conservatives, don't we? We want to just, do we? Um, not, not entirely sure. But uh, yeah, you know, we want we want something we can set a watch by. Oh, you know, it's just like flaky people, isn't it? You know, you don't want people that are all super flaky and going to come at different times. I mean, I'm, I must be talking about myself there. Uh, but we don't want that. I mean, you know, you can't change who you are. So that's what they're saying here. And now, a bit more of the book. The discoverers of the two forms of matter have yet to find out the qualities of antimatters, but a vivid description is already given in the Bhagavad Gita as follows. The scientist can make further research on the basis of this valuable information. So he's saying um, that the people who have discovered antimatter actually um, actually haven't, haven't kind of worked out the qualities of what that matter is. They've, they've not actually gone delved far, far enough into it to find out, you know, what, what there is about this antimatter that we need to be looking at or finding out. But luckily for them, the people um, 
who this book is based off and the research that these people that have wrote the book 3,000 years ago um, have done already lays out all that information. It makes it easy for the scientists. The scientists now just need to get this book and then and then cross-reference this book against against their uh, against their research. And that's it. You saw it. This book will be proven in no time. So here, an indentation. The antimaterial particle is finer than the finest of material particles. This living force is so powerful that it spreads its influence all over the material body. The mater antimaterial particle has immense potency in comparison to the material particle and consequently it cannot be destroyed. So, right, so the antimaterial particle is finer than the finest material particles. So I, I think, I, I'm wondering whether they're talking about quality there, like, you know, this is some proper high-grade high grade particles. This is, you know, you're going to want to get yourself a bit of this particle, this antimaterial particle. Um, or whether he's saying it's finest because it's actually extremely tiny, um, which, you know, could be hinting at quantum particles you know doing spooky things and allowing you to travel to mars for next to nothing really just a bit of your time and a bit of meditative practice so next of all this living force is so powerful that it spreads its influence all over the material body oh, spreading your influence uh it sounds a bit um sexual um probably want to keep it um quite tantric in this world i imagine but you know beggars can't be choosers if they've got to spread that um spread that influence all over then it's got to the antimaterial particle has immense potency so it's so one it's super fine and two it is well potent it is proper high grade it's the AK Kush you know what I mean um, and well that's just in comparison to the material particle there might be better stuff out there but we've not found it yet CBD oil eat your heart out this is but the beginning of the description of the antimaterial particle in the Bhagavad Gita. It is further explained as follows. The finest form of the material particle is encaged within the gross and subtle material bodies. Although the material bodies, both gross and subtle, are subject to destruction, the finer antimaterial particle is eternal. One's interest, therefore, should be in this eternal principle. Now, this sounds fine. This sounds cool to me. I mean, it's fine as form. Antimaterial particle is encaged within the gross and subtle material bodies. So I'm not really sure what the gross and subtle material bodies are. I'm sure they're absolutely fine. Um, however, um, it says that... Uh, the material bodies are subject to description. The antimaterial particle is eternal. One's interest, therefore, should be in this eternal principle. So basically it's saying um, because the material body is destructible um, and the antimaterial is eternal, we should probably just be interested in antimaterial properties and forget the physical realm. So I can see where it's coming from in terms of what I understand of like Buddhism and like birth and life and death. Um that uh, yeah we should just disregard the real world the real world is crap the real world has got nothing to offer us but the anti-material world now that's got uh, that's got everything because it's eternal however material things material particles okay what is constructed of con compounds and uh, different physical forms of, of anything like wood metal all that kind of stuff is made out of atoms and those atoms don't just disappear when we cause reactions they don't get destroyed all the atoms that are in the universe right now have always been in the universe and they're just constantly going around that's why some people would say that people are made of stars um not moby obviously moby would obviously say that it's just moby but um but he is uh his song is based on um the fact i might say fact that um you know the universe is around for billions of years and we're actually just made out of stars which is which is fine. We're allowed to be made out of stars. That's okay. Um, so it's saying keep your keep your eye on the on the eternal because that's where we want to be rocking right now. 
the perfection of science will occur when it is possible for the material scientist to know the qualities of antimaterial particle and liberate it from the association of non-permanent material particles. Such liberation would mark the culmination of scientific progress. So it's saying that science isn't perfect, um, and we know it isn't, you know, that's why we're always trying to kind of propose things. I say we, I'm not a scientist. I am merely a man who found a book on a train and is now attempting to record it. Um, but it's in the perfection of science, and from what I know of science, is that uh, it's an ongoing process and we learn things and things get disproven and, you know, things work temporarily, you know, certain laws to help us um, achieve certain things. But then as we delve deeper and learn more, we find out some things are wrong, but we're only functional. Does that sound right? We've got a scientist on hand here anywhere. Um, any scientists out there listening in, uh, please let me know. I'm very interested in finding out what, what the hell's going on. So it's saying that, um, you know, it's not perfect at the moment, but as soon as they find out, start reading this book. So the scientists start reading this book and work out what the hell's going on. Um, they're going to get closer to perfection. And that's when, and that's when scientists, scientificism, scientificism, uh, science uh, will be, uh, will be sorted when they, when they finally open their eyes. So we go. There is partial truth in the scientist's suggestion that there may exist also another world consisting of antimaterial atoms and that a clash between the material and antimaterial worlds will result in the annihilation of both. There is a clash which is continually going on. The annihilation of the material particles is taking place at every moment and the non-material particle is striving for liberation. This is explained in the Bhagavad Gita. So it's non-stop, mate. It's absolutely non-stop. We are there's there's basically he's saying that there's antimaterial particles in the material particles, and the reason why the material particles are getting smashed to pieces is to set the antimaterial particles free. I'm not sure um <clears throat> how how real that is. Um I mean not saying that it's not real I just mean like it's uh, I always imagine that um, antiparticles just kind of existed in their own thing um, like like dark matter so you've got everything that's matter you know things that you touch and, and you've got air and then when you get to space it's a vacuum it's not it's not got anything in it so it's not got any air particles or little particles in it so so it's saying what is all this nothing the nothing can't be any there's nothing can be nothing which means nothing has to be something uh, some like double negative for you there but um, so it has to be something so they're saying that this uh, so scientists say that this um, dark matter is like antimatter of some variety uh, I'm just going to double check this because uh, you know if I go on record for saying this someone might find this in 10 years and go oh yeah Mitchell thinks that uh, antimatter is dark matter when it's actually two completely different corresponding scientific theories um, so in monophysics antimatter is defined as a material composed of the antiparticles of the corresponding particles of ordinary matter so it's just like the opposite it's like it's, there's got to be one there's got to be an opposite to it minuscule numbers of antiparticles are generated daily at particle accelerators so they generate these things at places like CERN um, which is I think under construction to make it even bigger and even more scarier total production has only been a few nanograms and in natural processes like cosmic ray collision and some types of radioactive decay, but only a tiny fraction of these have successfully been bound together in experiments to form antiatoms. No macroscopic amounts of antimatter has ever been assembled due to the extreme cost and difficulty of production and handling. So, I'm not sure what it's saying in relation to this, but uh, that was quite interesting. So, the Bhagavad Gita has to say this about the non particles. The non-material particle, which is the living entity, influences the material particle to work. This living entity is always indestructible, just always. As long as the non-material particle is within the lump of material energy. Known by the names of gross and subtle bodies, then the entity is manifest as a living unit. Lol, unit in the continuous clashing between the two particles, 
the non-material particle is never annihilated. But no one can destroy the anti-material particle at any time, past, present or future. Oh, geez, Louise, that is a, that's a lot to take on there. So I'm trying to read it. I'm trying to understand it at exactly the same time and then trying to think of something funny to say about it. Not funny, something relevant to say about it. So as long as a non-material particle is within the lump of material energy, then the entity is manifest as a living unit. Oh, God. Oh, so it's saying that only uh, material particles... So I'm a human, I'm made out of material particles. Only things that are human or like living can have, oh, when they've got non-material particles within them, that makes them living. So what's making me alive right now is actually non-material particles in my body, according to this book. Um, And so what it's saying is, I'm getting it now, I see where it's going with this. So what it's saying is uh, that the anti-material properties within me, my material properties, I think it's saying it's your soul. So it's saying you can't destroy past, present or future. So it's saying this is why there's continual birth and redeath and reincarnation because within me is the anti-material properties. The anti-material properties are actually probably my soul. Maybe it's going to say this in a bit, but I don't know if soul is the right word for these guys. So it's saying, okay, you you understand now you've got the material, you've got the anti-material. Um, you as a material being... Um, could be like wood, but wood and stuff doesn't contain antimaterial particles, according to earlier in the book. And that is going to, um, and that is that is what is within you that cannot be destroyed, and uh, that is what your soul is. So this is what I'm gathering so far. It may prove me to be incorrect slightly further down in the book. Therefore, we think that the theory maintaining that the material and antimaterial worlds may clash resulting in the annihilation of both worlds. Armageddon, Armageddon. Is correct only within the context of the scientists' limited de- definition of antimatter. The Bhagavad Gita explains the nature of the antimatter particle, which can never be annihilated. So he's saying, scientists don't have all the answers. Their, their definition of antimaterial and antiparticles and stuff is limited. Although when I was looking at a Wikipedia page, trust me, it was... <laughs> It was going pretty deep. I had to really um, frisk, um, frisk over that. Yeah, yeah, that's that could work. I really had to frisk over it. <laughs> um, but saying the Bhagavad Gita explains all this. The scientists may catch up. Now let's find out what it has to explain about this. The fine and immeasurable anti-material particle is always indestructible, permanent, and eternal. After a certain period, however, its encagement by material particles is annihilated. This same principle also operates in the case of the antimaterial and material worlds. No one should fear the annihilation of the antimaterial particle, for it survives the annihilation of material worlds. Okay, someone's going to have to help me here. I'm kind of confused. So it's saying that you shouldn't fear the annihilation of the antimaterial particle because it survives the annihilation of material worlds. Oh, so it's just saying the material world is going to get destroyed, but don't worry about the antimaterial particle. He's fine. He's going he's gonna to survive that. That's just a material world thing. The antimaterial world's chilling, bruv. It's chilling. It's indestructible. It's like Wolverine. Antimaterial particle is Wolverine. It's going... Hey, you can't mess with me, man. I'm just gonna grow back stronger. I've got adamantium skeleton, bruv. Don't, don't, don't diss me. Well, you can diss me because sticks and stones may break my bones, but antimaterial particles will never be hurt, G. And that's what what it's trying to say. Um, let's carry on. We're on page eight now, ladies and gentlemen. If I haven't said it's Mitch Wade Cole here. Um, catch me in the material world on Facebook, Instagram, probably any any social media if you just put in Mitch Wade Cole I'm sure something will come up I get about even TikTok um, which is uh, definitely a, a product of the material world if you ever go on it absolutely uh, crazy little place that is everything that is created is annihilated at a certain stage both the material body and the material world are created and they are therefore subject to annihilation 
The antimaterial particle, however, is never created and consequently it is never annihilated. This is also this also is corroborated in the Bhagavad Gita. The antimaterial particle, which is the vital force, is never born or created. It exists eternally. It is neither birth date nor death date. It is neither repeatedly created nor repeatedly destroyed. It is eternally existing and therefore it is the oldest of the old and yet it is always fresh and new. Although the material particle is annihilated, the antimaterial particle is never affected. So he's saying the antimaterial particle is never affected. Um, I'm not sure what, what I'm supposed to extrapolate from this, but um, uh, but it says affected, like A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. So it's not saying that it's been effect, effect, effected, where uh, some kind of physical force has caused it to you know be destroyed or not destroyed it's saying that it doesn't hurt its feelings so it's like all right you know the material particle is annihilated but the anti-material particle is just it just is just doesn't care actually it's just like it's quite apathetic it's like oh you know he was my buddy he was my anti buddy but um this is how he, he speaks just like scientists from episode one uh you know he's my buddy but he doesn't get affected you know he's just uh he's just a He's just chilling with a still, and you know what I mean. Like that happens to him. Now, you know, I've had I've had material particle friends like him before, and he just, you know, they just get blown up sometimes. And what can you do? You know, just sometimes you just get annihilated, and you got to uh, you got to just rock with the party. Do you know what I mean? Um, but also, you're saying that that it exists eternally. So this anti-material particle, unlike the material, has just always been around since oh man, unimaginable times. Google Googleplexes of times more multiples of Googleplexes blah 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 um, it's been around forever and it will be around forever and it's us that are temporary let's carry on into the darkness I mean the light let's carry on the principle is also applied to the antimaterial world universe as well as to the antimaterial particle when the material universe is annihilated the antimaterial universe exists in all circumstances this will be explained in more detail later the scientists may also learn the following from the Bhagavad Gita the learned man who knows perfectly well that the antimaterial particle is indestructible knows that it can not be annihilated by any means. Bless me, I must have got a bit of antimaterial particle uh, making me sneeze there. I'm, aller I'm allergic to the antimaterial. The atomic scientist may consider annihilating the material world by nuclear weapons, but his weapons cannot destroy the antimaterial world. The antimaterial particle is clearly explained in the following lines. It is neither cut into pieces by any material weapon, nor is it burnt by fire, nor is it moistened by water, nor withered, nor dried up, nor evaporated in the air. It is indivisible, non-flammable and insoluble. Because it is eternal, it cannot enter into and leave any sort of body. Being steady by constitution, it is quality, its qualities are always fixed. It is inexplicable because it is contrary to all material qualities. It is unthinkable by the ordinary brain. It is unchangeable. No one, therefore, should ever lament for what is an eternal antimaterial principle. So it's saying... It's not burnt by fire. It can't, you can't burn it with fire. The scientists have been trying to drop bombs on it. But, you know, actually, you know what? From what we just read from the Wikipedia page, um, the scientists have managed to kind of extract a bit of this antimaterial matter uh, using like the Large Hadron Collider and Super Colliders. Uh, dropping a nuke on it, that was stupid. It didn't really do anything. They split an atom, but that's just splitting an atom. That's uh, it's like splitting ours, isn't it? Um, but it's... 
Splitting an atom isn't the same as smashing two atoms together and getting um, antimaterial protons, from what I'm aware. Um, if we can get a scientist in here at any point, that could be really great. Maybe I should get someone who's a scientist. If you know any scientists out there, shout out Mitch Wade Carl at facebook.com uh, in the material world. Uh, who knows who I am in the antimaterial world? I could be anyone. And uh, an influencer of the antimaterial. And uh, just having a quick look here. It's not burnt by fire. Fire, oh, I try and set fire to it all day long. Maybe anti-fire, but what's that? That sounds like ice. But it is not moistened by water. You can't use it as a sponge. It's not a sponge. It's not dried up by the air. It's not indivisible, non-flammable, and so it just is nothing. It's just, you can't even touch it with the material world. The material world does not even get anywhere near. So, carrying on deeper into the book, the end of page nine. Thus, in the Bhagavad Gita, and in all other Vedic literatures, the superior energy, anti-material principle, is accepted as the vital force or the living spirit. This is also called Jaiva. This living principle cannot be generated by any combination of material elements. There are eight material principles which are described as inferior energies. So we've got the antimaterial bit, or the antimaterial energy, no, the material energies, which are like living spirits and stuff like forces. Oh, yeah. And then there's eight that are just like inferior, they're, they're no good, they're, they're cool. Yeah, don't get them wrong, don't get them wrong, cool stuff, but ain't got nothing on this anti-material world. And here they are listed as follows. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. You know what, that makes me feel really, really bad for Captain Planet. You know Captain Planet? He is bloody gutted to find out that his uh, energy forces are actually quite inferior. You know, he's got earth, water, fire, air, um, and then heart. <laughs> I remember thinking about Captain Planet in that way. He was, uh, it was like, okay, I'm Captain Planet and I'm going to give you each a special planet, a uh, special power of the planet. And all the, all the kids are like, oh, wicked, I can't wait. Cheers, Captain Planet, you weird blue man, but like legend in his own right. Um, what, what have we got then? So you, you get fire and he's like, sick. What does that mean? He's like, you put this ring on it, you can do like fire tricks. It's like, boom, sick. You get water. He's like, what does that mean? Oh, you can do water tricks, give him the ring there. And it's like, your earth. And he's like, oh no, that doesn't sound good. No, it's sick. You can make like earthquakes and you can um, blow stuff up. Um, and then you get wind and he's like, what, what can I do with wind? It's not, isn't, it's not farts and stuff, is it? It's like, no, it's not farts. I'm not, I'm not a joker. I'm actually quite serious about saving the planet here. And methane is one of the biggest causes of, of global warming. So it's not going to be farts, is it? Um, it's going to be wind. You're going to be able to make like hurricanes and stuff, which are, you know, consequences of global warming. However, um, I'm, you're going to use it for good. You're going to like knock down like um, power plants and stuff. And then there's a little kid, he's like, oh, wicked, they got wicked powers. What have I got, um, Captain Planet? He's like, you've got heart. He's like, oh, what's heart? He's like, oh, you know, you can just really love people. It's like, oh, like, is it it going to do any special, like, tricks or anything? Like, you know, beat people up, you know, heart beat people up. It's like, no, no, you just, you just, you just got heart, mate. I'm sorry about that, bruv. It's like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's cool. I mean, it's better than having nothing, Captain Planet. He's like, no, it's, it is quite important, says Captain Planet, but um, not very cool. Can I just get, like, lightning? Is that, no, 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 you can't get lightning. I was like, why not? Actually, no, that's a good point. I probably should have made lightning. Maybe I could have made six. Anyway, so Captain Planet, he is bloody great. Uh, if you've ever watched Captain Planet, um, I'm sure the Extinction Rebellion people down, um, down at Marble Arch, they've watched Captain Planet. Um, it makes me think, like, that, you know, maybe we've been thinking about this far too long. Where's Captain Planet when you need him? I hope he's going to come out and save us all from um, global warming. Um, Captain Planet theme. There we go. It's just for a bit of nostalgia here, a bit of a breakup uh, from this. There we go. Wind, water, go, 
<laughs> there is heart. I am Captain Planet. Captain Planet. He's a hero. Gonna take pollution down to zero. He's our powers. Uh, I'm sorry, Captain Planet. It seems that your skills are no longer relevant. Yours are inferior skills, especially compared to this book. So let's get back into this book after that uh, little segue into Captain Planet there. Apart from these, is the living force or the antimaterial principle, which is described as the superior energy. So as again, Captain Planet. These are called energies because they are wielded and controlled by the supreme living being, the personality of Godhead, Krishna. Bloody Godhead, mate. For a long time, the materialist was limited within the boundaries of the eight material principles mentioned above. Sorry, Captain Planet. Now it is encouraged to see that he has a little preliminary information of the antimaterial principle and the antimaterial universe. We hope that with the progress of time, the materialist will be able to estimate the value of the antimaterial world, in which there is no trace of material principles. Of course, the very word antimaterial indicates that the principle is in opposition to all material qualities. So, it's just kind of this book at the moment. I feel like in these first ten pages, it's reiterating a lot. It's going, God, if you didn't understand. There's an anti-material world that's indestructible and a material world that's destructible. We've just listed everything that can be, that is good about the material world, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, ego. And they're inferior to the anti-material world. The anti-material world is where it's at. I've got two turntables and a microphone. It's, it's probably in a Beck song some way. It's probably, Beck has covered all this, but he is a Scientologist now, which is, God, I'd, I'd love to see Scientologists and the dudes from this book have a fight. That'd be well good. Might Google it later. See if it's on YouTube. I'll let you know. There are, of course, the mental speculators. Not mental because they're crazy. Who can comment upon the antimaterial principle. These fall into two main groups and they arrive at two different erroneous conclusions. One group, the gross materialists, either denies the anti-material principle or admits only the disintegration of material combination at a certain stage. Death, death. The other group accepts the anti-material principle as being in direct opposition to the material principle with its 24 categories. This group is known as the Sankhites, Sankhites, and they investigate material principles and analyze them minutely. So there's a bunch of brares out there called Sankhites. They're the ones that are looking into the material world just to check, because you go, oh yeah, we disregard the material world, but we need peeps out there to go and check the properties of these and see how they kind of interact. Because if there's earth, there's anti-earth, you know, we need to find out what the positive earths are the positive energies to then work out what the anti-energies are and it makes complete sense doesn't it if you really think about it at the end of their investigation Sankhites finally accept only a transcendental anti-material non-active principle however difficulties arise for all these mental speculators because they speculate with the help of inferior energy they do not accept information from the superior. In order to realize the position of the antimaterial principle, one must rise to the transcendental plane of superior energy through Bhakti Yoga, which is the very active, very activity of superior energy. So now we found it out the first, on page 11, the first touch upon this, that the way that we must get to this anti-material plane is to rise to the transcendental plane of superior energy through back to yoga. So this yoga, as we were saying, the highest grade of yoga, the best form of it 
is the way we're going to get to the anti-material world and check it out. You can be in the material world looking around all day. You could get, you can, you could burn a little fire, and you can look at it all day and go, okay, yeah, it definitely is an energy, but you know, you're not going to find anything out until you get to the anti-material world, and that's really going to show you what everything that you need. Obviously, ladies and gentlemen, please. Sorry, Captain Planet. From the platform of the material world, one cannot estimate the real position of the anti-material world. But the Supreme Lord is the controller of both material and anti-material energies. Descends out of his, capital H, causeless mercy and gives us complete information of the anti-material world. In this way, we can know what the anti-material world is. The Supreme Lord and the living entities of both anti-material quality, we are informed. So there's this dude out there called the Supreme Lord, and he's the controller of everything. So what's he made out of? Like he must be. What the hell's he made out? He's made of. Um, you got material and anti-material energy. The anti-material is timeless and thingy. But then there's this supreme lord that's like the leader of all the energies. Like, what? What's it? What? I mean, that, I mean, that's obvious. I mean, you, you know, you don't want to go and start asking too many questions, you know. Uh, but I'm quite an investigative mind. One of the most investigative minds in the whole of um, this area of Turnpike Lane, which is where I live, Turnpike Lane. Don't, don't at me. Every living entity is an individual person. Therefore, the supreme living being must also be the supreme person. So every living entity is an individual person. Therefore, the supreme living being must be a supreme living person. In the Vedic literatures, the supreme person is probably claimed to be Krishna. The name Krishna, indicating the supreme lord, is the only truly intelligible name of the highest order. He's the controller. controller. He's the controller of both material and anti-material energies. And the very word Krishna signifies that he is the supreme controller. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord confirms this as follows. Let me just have a little breather here. Okay, so Krishna is the supreme lord. And the only truly intelligible name of the highest order. So this Krishna dude, or Krishna, um, Supreme Lord, he's the best. He's the one who has all the energy. He's he's a real person somewhere out there, and uh, he's going to be smashing it. So the Bhagavad Gita, this book that we've been hearing all about, has all the answers to all of our scientific woes. Um, the Lord of that confirms as follows. So now let's get really deep into this, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, Captain Planet. There are two worlds. The material and the anti-material. The material world is composed of inferior qualitative energy divided into eight material principles. The anti-material world is made of superior qualitative energy. Because both the material and anti-material energies are emanations of the Supreme Transcendence, the Personality of Godhead, it is proper to conclude that I, Lord Krishna, am the ultimate cause of all creations and annihilations. So it's him, he's the reason. So can he not just go, oh, you know, I don't want to create stuff, I don't want to annihilate stuff. Or is he just the overwatcher of a process that has been going on for Eternia? No, he man. It's hard to it's hard to check, but he's going to talk to us a little bit more about this now, as we're on page twelve. Because the Lord's two energies, inferior and superior, manifest the material and anti-material worlds. He is called the supreme absolute truth. The Lord Krishna explains. This in the Bhagavad Gita, thus. I am Arjuna, the highest principle of transcendence. And there is nothing greater than me. Capital M. 
everything that be rests on my energies. My with a capital M. Exactly like pearls on a thread. Okay, I embellished the there. He didn't do that, but so everything, all these energies, rest like pearls on a thread, like planets on strings held up in front of your eyes by the thread at the end, and they're rocking back and forth like the ticking, like the ticking pendulum of a grandfather clock. If the grandfather clock had multiple pendulums upon them. Again, embellishing heavily here, but he's pretty. I'm not saying he's like full of himself, but I mean, he's saying this is what it is. I mean, I mean, it sounds quite egotistical to me, but I guess we have to find out a little bit more. Long, long before the discovery of the principles of antimatter and the antimaterial worlds, the subject was delineated in the pages of the Bhagavad Gita. The Gita indicates itself that its philosophy had previously been taught to the presiding deity of the sun, which implies that the principles of the Bhagavad Gita were expounded by the personality of Godhead long before the battle of Kuruksetra, at least some 120 million years before. Jeez Louise, so there was a, a battle in Kuruksetra, Kuruk, 120 million years ago. Bloody Nora, this has been going on for a while, hasn't it? Oh, you need a bit of change from the norm. Maybe we can do that with the whole Large Hadron Collider, you know, really mess stuff up, but bloody Nora. He's been doing it for a long while. Let's get back in. Now, modern science has only just discovered a fraction of the truths that are available in the Bhagavad Gita. Again, reiterating that if we just read this book, we we're going to be miles ahead. Why, why aren't they putting this on the university syllabus? Oh, they might as well get on the bloody silly bus, these silly guys, these scientists with uh, with their limited knowledge of the um, personality of Godhead and uh, all different principles of matter and antimatter. So a lot we, we could be learning here, you know. Just having a sip of mystical water there as we enter the final quarter of this round. The assumption of an antimaterial universe is also found in the Bhagavad Gita, and from all data available, it is to be assumed without the slightest doubt that the antimaterial world is situated in the antimaterial sky. A sky which is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita as Sanatana Dharma, or the eternal nature. Now that kind of sort of goes against scientific privilege principles really where every, you, you got to doubt everything you know don't take anything for granted there's no doubt um like Gwen Stefani you know okay she you know we do doubt her a little bit before a uh, cultural appropriation sometimes on the internet I mean if you know I'm more of a live and let live kind of dude you know if she wants to wear a thing on the middle of her head um that's fine and it's also um mass produced in Indian culture as a fashion accessory anyway um, more than the kind of ceremonial side of things but what I'm trying to say here is the book is telling me that it, you just, just assume this without any doubt. Don't even try and think for yourself. Just roll with it. Uh, the antimaterial world is actually uh, situated in the antimaterial sky. So we've got a material sky and a material world and a material ground. But there, the antimaterial world and the antimaterial sky is one. Um, so let's carry on now that we've got that down. Exactly as material atoms create the material world, the antimaterial atoms create the antimaterial world with all its paraphernalia. The antimaterial world is inhabited by antimaterial living beings. In the antimaterial world, there is no inert matter. Everything there is a living principle, and the supreme personality in that region is God Himself. The denizens of the antimaterial world possesses eternal life, the eternal not external knowledge and eternal bliss. In other words, they have all the qualifications of God. 
So it got sort of bumping on a bit of a um, Christianity vibe here. I didn't realise that, you know, that kind of like Indian cultures and all that kind of stuff had talked about a God, you know. Um, I did hear once that uh, rather than, and it's Easter Sunday, so this is perfect, uh, rather than um, when Jesus got locked in a cave and he died and he came back and then he went to heaven, apparently he went over to India. Has anyone ever heard of that theory before? Um, yeah, apparently Jesus went over to India and there's like, there's this tomb where they think actually that's probably where he is. They say that's where he is actually buried. This, this dude who came from uh, the Middle East with like uh, blessings and practices and stuff. Um, they're saying that is that was Jesus. He just did a runner to um, India somewhere. Um, Jesus in India. Yeah, here we go. Um, it puts forward the view that Jesus survived crucifixion, left Judea and migrated eastwards in order to continue his mission to the lost tribes of Israel, travelling through Persia and Afghanistan and eventually dying a natural and honourable death in Kashmir at an old age. Ghulam Ahmad applies textual analysis of both the Gospels and Islamic sources, the Quran and Hadith, and also drew upon medical and historical material including what he claimed were ancient Buddhist records to argue his case. Although independent modern scholars such as Norbert Clart, Clart, <laughs> Blood Clart, Norbert Clart, have rejected Gullam Ahmed's use of the latter sources as misreadings of material unrelated to Jesus. Anyway, all I'm trying to say is that I didn't really think they talked about God much in that kind of world, but uh, Jesus, Jesus is out there and he's buried there, so... Check him out. He's in Kashmir. If anyone checks him out, let me know. Um, you can uh, catch me at uh, Mitch Ray Cole on all the social medias. Please bust bus us a message. Bust me a tight message. And uh, we want to find out if, if Jesus is out there. <laughs> Sorry, Captain Planet. So here we go. In the material world, the topmost planet is called Satyaloka or Brahmaloka. Beings of the greatest talents live on this planet. Mate, I want to see if Britain's got talent in there. Satya Loka has got talent. Mate, imagine the stuff they'll be doing there, like backflips and flying. It'd basically be like Dragon Ball Z, really, wouldn't it? The presiding deity of Brahma Loka is Brahma, the first created being of this material world. Oh, so this other planet in the top, in the material world so this is ah oh, so this is our material world it's a planet we've not been to yet but it's called satyaloka and then the the first created being of this thing uh, brahma he's 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 the best he's the top dog he's like simon cow he's a living being like so many of us but he's the most talented personality in the material world he's bloody talented he's like susan boyle he is not so talented that he is in the category of God, Simon Cowell, but he is in the category of those living entities directly dominated by God. God and the living entities both belong to the antimaterial world. The scientist, therefore, would be rendering service to everyone by researching the continuation of the antimaterial world, how it is administered, how things are shaped there, who are the presiding personalities, and so on. So again, it's going back to scientists and saying, yo, scientists, you, you do never want a bit of a service, yeah, if you start checking out this antimaterial world. Even Brahma, the most talented guy on the most talented planet. Of the Vedic literatures, Srimad Bhagavatam deals elaborately with these matters. The Bhagavad Gita is a preliminary study of Srimad Bhagavatam. These two important books of knowledge should be thoroughly studied by all men in the scientific world. Yeah, read these books, scientists. I told, we've thought about this a billion times already, okay? There's answers in here that you've not even scratched the surface of yet. You only just got to the material world. There's other stuff in here that we need to be finding out, okay? So if you just get a few blokes on it, have a read, and then we can we can get to the next anti-material world. What's so crazy about that? These two important books of knowledge should be thoroughly studied by all men in the scientific world. These books would give many clues to scientific progress and would indicate many new discoveries. 
The transcendentalists and the materialists are two distinct classes of men. The transcendentalists gather knowledge from authoritative scriptures like the Vedas. Vedic literature is received from authoritative sources which are in the line of transcendental discipline succession. This dis disciplic succession, parampara, is also mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. So there's a couple of guys here that are quite important. You've got the transcendentalists uh, and the materialists are two distinct classes of men. So the transcendentalists gather all the knowledge from the scriptures and I think the materialists just like are the ones who are concerned with the energies, the two energies. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that hundreds of thousands of years ago, the Gita was spoken to the presiding deity of the sun who delivered the knowledge to his son, Manu, from whom the present generation of man has transcended. So we all transcended from Gita, uh, uh, from the, we, we were all just transcended from the presiding deity of the sun and his son, S-O-N, Manu, we all descended from. So Manu, I don't know, I don't know whether he, um, managed to re re uh, reproduce using mitosis or whether there was another, like a female Manu there so he could uh, go and then create a few more men that we're all transcended from or descended from. Uh, I'm not sure, but it just talks about Manu. So I've always thought it took two to tango, but Manu is a solo legend. Manu, in his turn, delivered the, this transcendental knowledge to his son, King Iksvaku, who is the forefather of the dynasty in which the personality of Godhead, Sri Rama, appeared. Uh, so this Sri Rama is a direct descendant from the King Iksvaku, which gives him some sort of magical authority. This long chain of disciplic succession was broken during the advent period of Lord Krishna 5,000 years ago. And for this reason, Krishna restated the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, therefore making him the first disciple of this knowledge in his age. Legend. Krishna's bloody... No, Arjuna is killing it, mate. He's the first guy for ages to have this kind of power. And that's what we want. We need this kind of power. So we've only got about 10 minutes left, guys. Hopefully, um, it's not going to drive us all crazy, but... Let's rock this party. Without troubling himself with materialistic research work, the transcendentalist acquires the truths concerning matter and antimatter in the most perfect way through his disciplic succession and thereby saves himself much botheration. <laughs> Just got a laugh there. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard of... Um, bother be <laughs> be called botheration like the process of bothering someone is called botheration that's amazing um, I think the only thing that bothers me a bit is botheral have you ever been bothered by botheral before mate it's I I'm, I'm used to live in the place where Marmite was created uh, Burton on Trent or it's either created or it's just made there because it's a brewing town but um, uh I've never been bothered by Marmite, but for some reason, uh, Marmite has always quite bothered me. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Bovril's fine. It's fine. It's okay. But I feel like if you gave that to a child, it would be a form of abuse. you got to let people make their own decisions. So botheration, my new favourite word. The gross materialists, however do not believe in the antimaterial worlds of the personality of Godhead. They are therefore unfortunate creatures, although sometimes very talented, educated and advanced otherwise. They are bewildered by the influence of the material manifestation and are devoid of knowledge of things antimaterial. So the materialists just don't even know about the antimaterial world. I mean, I don't know if that's on purpose so that, you know, two people can look at either side in their own way to try and work out some mad mad stuff so they can not be you know horse blinded 
horse blinders so they can keep it separate. I'm not sure if that's the reason, but I mean, that could be quite good. It may even be possible for them to make sufficient progress to be able to know the details of this anti-material world where the personality of Godhead resides as the predominating figure and where the living entities live with him, capital H, and serve him, capital H. The living entities who serve the Godhead are equal in quality to him, but at the same time they are predominated as servitors. So the personality of Godhead, he can't do this on his own. He's just one dude with special properties and descending from... Uh, what a yawn. It's very early. Um, descended from Godhead. Descended from Arjuna and King Ixkaviku. Um, they're his servers. They're equal to him. They've got all the powers and the deities and everything because we've got all got antimaterial particles in us. But they are still predominated down to as a servitor. They can't be the personality godhead. And they can't all be the personality godhead. You need just one personality godhead. In the antimaterial world, there is no def difference between the predominated and the predominator. Only in the material world. The relationship is in perfection and without tinge of materialism. So the antimaterial world, um, everyone's equal, but in the material world, you've got the Godhead and you've got the servitures. The nature of the material world is destructive, according to the Bhagavad Gita. There is some partial truth to the assumption of the physical scientist that there is annihilation of the material and antimaterial world when they when they chance to clash. The material world is creation of changing modes of nature. These modes, known as gunas, <laughs> literally the modes are known as gunas, but not not gunas as in uh, Arsenal. Um, just just general gunas, spelled G U N A S. Are known as sattva. Okay. Are known as sattva, goodness, rajas, passion, and tamas, ignorance. The material world is created by the mode of rajas, passion, maintained by the mode of sattva, goodness, and annihilated by the mode of tamas, ignorance. So the material world is. So the material world is actually created by a passion. Maintained by goodness and then annihilated by ignorance. Oh, that's so true, isn't it? Oh, a bit of, hey, a bit of ignorance. It's always ruining everything, isn't it? Bloody ignorance. This is what, this is what I'm talking about here. This is why I'm reading through this book. I'm trying not to be ignorant. I'm not trying to judge people that do this kind of thing. I'm trying to work out, yeah, find out more about it. But, you know, it's a, it's a tough world out there. There's a lot of ignorance, and it's you know there's not enough time to find out a lot of the, a lot of the time what what's good and what's not. These modes are omnipresent in the material world, and as such, at every hour, every minute, and every second, the process of creation, maintenance, and annihilation is taking place all over the material universe. The highest planet of the material unit universe, Brahmaloka is also subject to these modes of nature. Although the duration of life on that planet due to the predominance of the mode of sattva, goodness, is said to be, well, this is a big number now, this is, we're, we're landing on a big cliffhanger here, ladies and gentlemen. So the lifespan on this planet is 4,300,000 times 1,000 times two, times 30, times 12, times 100 solar years. I don't even know if I've got time to, to do this calculation. That's, I mean, they could have done the calculation for us, but the, we've got to times all these things by each other. By each other. And then, yeah, I just tried to do it um, in my own time because there's not very long left of the podcast. And sadly, um, it didn't work. And let's just assume it's a really, really, really long time. But despite this long duration, but so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. 
the end of episode two of Easy Journey to Other Planets. Catch me, uh, Mitch Wade Cole, on all the social media platforms. Thank you so much for Freds for uh, broadcasting me and allowing me. Welcome, guys, back to another episode of Easy Journey to Other Planets. It's It's been a wild one, really, so far. It's episode three. I've been reading through this book that I found on the tube. Uh, the book is called Easy Journey to Other Planets, and it's a it's a Harry Krishna book, essentially. Let me readjust this mic. It's a Harry Krishna book, and yeah, it's been pretty wild. It's about all sorts of things. It's about traveling to other planets using bhakti yoga, and giving scientists a run for their money, saying that um, you don't need to. Um, <clears throat> You don't need to use science and different kinds of methods to get to different planets. You can just use yoga and meditation, so it's been wild. I mean, one thing, though, I've got to tell you guys, that this will be the final episode of Easy Journey to Other Planets. As I travel to a whole new planet myself, a whole new planet um, of exploration in the radio medium, and I really hope that you'll, um, you'll meditate and come join me there on this next planet. Um, I'll explain a little bit more maybe about what that will be, but it's going to be in the same slot monthly on Fred's Radio. And thanks so much for Fred's for the support and uh, yeah, giving me a platform to start messing around with this kind of vibes. So as it's a special uh, episode, final episode, I'm going to skip um, 37 pages uh, from chapter one straight to chapter two, um, which should be really interesting. And I hope that you guys are going to enjoy it. Um, I hope you enjoy listening to my voice as much as people think I do. <laughs> so this uh, chapter two is called Varieties of Planetary Systems. This is probably what we wanted to listen to the whole time, really, because, um, you know, uh, you know, getting to other planets and finding out why it's important is fine. You want to know what's going on in these different planets, you know what I mean? Like, it's all good going, yeah, man, one day we're going to travel to other planets and it's going to be really sweet. It's like, yeah, what's hap- what happens on those other planets? You know, it doesn't matter about that. It's like, yes, it does. I want to know what happens on June and Mars and Venus and Jupiter and all that kind of vibe. I think that's absolutely fine to want to know about. So let me read a little chunk of this and then we'll go start dissecting it and see what actual magic we can conjure. In these days, when men are trying to go to the moon, people should not think that Krishna consciousness is concerned with something old-fashioned. I'm not sure. Oh, that's it. So what they're trying to say is, you know, we're trying to go to the moon. We're all scientists and all those Krishnas don't don't care about the moon. Yeah, they do. Don't think of them as old-fashioned. These guys are more futuristic than you. They go further into the past and they're going to go further into the future. So let's rock this party. When the world is progressing to reach the moon, we are contacting Hare Krishna. But people should not misunderstand and assume that we are lagging behind modern scientific advancement. I mean, they're not lagging behind, essentially. But it's not like they've you know come up with rocket ships and um, projectiles and created missiles and gone to actual outer space. I mean, you know, they have, okay, in the mines and then their yoga practices, but they haven't got much to show for it at this moment, is what I'm trying to say. And that's fine. That's cool. I mean, I don't go around saying, I am I go to the moon and stuff like that. I'm just happy here recording pointless podcasts for um, radio stations. So, here we go. Let's rock again. One more time. I like that punk. We have already passed all scientific advancement. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that man's attempt to reach higher planets is not new. Oh no. Newspaper headlines read, Man's first steps on the moon. But the reporters do not know that millions and millions of men went there and came back. This is not the first time. This is an ancient practice. That's my fault, I guess, really, isn't it? Um, Because 
<clears throat> I did assume that only Neil Armstrong went to the moon and, you know, his mates and then a few people may have gone afterwards. But, you know, I, I was even sceptical that they went to the moon at one point. You know, is it is it true? Is the moon landing true? All these different kinds of conspiracies. No, Neil Armstrong, sorry, mate. Uh, it's all over for you guys because these guys have been going, millions of people have gone there. You just haven't really sought to seek out why that, that might be the reason. You're an idiot. Oh, what's a really good thing? Oh, yeah, Neil Armstrong. So it stands for Neil A. If you say that backwards, it is it actually says alien. Do, 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 do. Now, isn't that freaky? So let's uh, carry on in our journey to varieties of planetary systems. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated, Abrahma Bhuvanal Loka Puna Avatino Rajuna My dear Arjuna, even if you could go to the highest planetary system, which is called Brahmaloka, you will have to come back. Therefore, interplanetary travel is not new. It is known to the Krishna consciousness devotees. Since we are Krishna conscious, we take what Krishna says to be the absolute truth. With capital letters on A and T. According to Vedic literature, there are many planetary systems. The planetary system in which we are living is called Barloka. Above this planetary system is Bavarloka. Bavarloka and Bavarloka. Above that is Svarloka, the moon belonging to the Svarloka planetary system. Above Svarloka is Maharloka. Above that is Janaloka. And above that is Satyaloka. Similarly, there are lower planetary systems. Thus, there are 14 statuses of planetary systems within this universe, and the sun is the chief planet. Wait a sec. That's actually kind of kind of cool, uh, because it's saying that in the, in the entirety of all of these uh, planetary systems, um, there's 14. So the sun is in the centre. So think about it like this, then. You've got 12 planetary systems. As in, you got the sun, and then you got, you know, all of the all of the planets. Uh, let's see if we can remember all the planets now: Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, no Pluto. Oh wait, how many how many planets are there? Planets in the solar system. See, I'm not woke at all. How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. There's eight. That's saying there's fourteen. And uh, I remember these conspiracy theories from while from a while ago, um, saying uh, that there was like you know there's a hidden planet, planet X, and you know maybe the Bhagavad Gita has revealed to us that there's more planets than we thought. You know ones that are sm- too small and far out, and all these kind of different vibes, and um, and we just haven't found them yet, and they're going to go get us, and that that could be a potential possibility. Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess we just we should be worried. Um, and but also, you know, hopefully somewhere in the back of our Gita, they're going to reveal that to us, and we can work it out. That would be pretty cool. I'm just going to have a sip of uh, spiritual tea here. Now, or does there are fourteen statuses of planetary systems within this universe, and the sun is the chief planet. Sun is a bit of a chief to be H. Gotta say, uh, yeah, I love a good bit of sun. Uh, in Britain, we don't get to see him as as much as um, other people do. Or, you know, which I'm which I'm dealing with in my own way. Uh, you know, with vitamin D pills and plants and and whatever else I can rub on my skin. Let's carry on. The sun is described in the Bhagavad Gita. I, I'm not going to read all this. There's a whole sentence of. Um, uh, of a language that I can't pronounce and would only be a terrible, terrible shame uh, for me to do. Um, it would it would ruin everything, I think. So I was going to skip that to the translation, which I, uh, is written in um, the Queen's English. 
that I'll be able to uh, write, uh, get across to you guys, right? I worship Govinda, the primeval lord, by whose order the sun assumes immense power and heat and traverses its orbit. The sun, which is the chief among all planetary systems, is the eye of the supreme lord. So it's like the eye of Sauron, isn't it, really? Damn it, have, have we, have, is this orc literature? Am I really getting... Am I getting tempted by the dark side here? You know, what, who are the hobbits? The hobbits, do the hobbits think that the sun is, is good? Probably not, they've got lower surface area, so the sun burns them to a crisp, easier than other things, uh, poor hobbits. But um, just to think about it for a second here. Um, yeah, it's the Eye of Sauron sitting up top of a vessel, um, waiting to get its strength back and its body back. Um, uh, once it gets a hold of those pesky rings. Now, let's carry on and see what they're saying about the sun itself. Actually, without the sun, we cannot see. We may be very proud of our eyes, but we cannot even see our next door neighbor. People challenge, can you show me God? But what can they see? What is the value of their eyes? God is not cheap. We cannot see anything. Not to speak of God without sunshine. Without sunshine, we are blind. At night, we cannot see anything, and therefore, we use electricity because the sun is not present. There is not only one sun in the cosmic manifestation. There are millions and trillions of suns. That is also stated in the Brahma Samhita. Mate, that was good. That was pretty good. Come on, admit it. That was one of the nicest things I've ever read. Oh, that was beautiful. Can you show me, God? But what can they see? What is the value of our eyes? God is not cheap. We cannot see anything. Yeah, it is true, actually. You know, without the sun, we can't see anything. So I'm not saying that it's true that the sun is God. But without it, no, we cannot see. We are blind. Uh, at night, we need electricity... Yeah, we don't necessarily need it. I mean, the, you know, you still see the moon up there, which is where we're probably going to be heading uh, really shortly. I'm going to give the tips and the secrets to getting up there. I'm going to use electricity because the sun is not present. Yeah, there are. There is not only one sun. There is a cosmic, in the cosmic manifestation. There are millions of trillions of suns shedding their light all over the worlds of the planetary bodies. Let's, uh, there's another quotation here. And then there's a translation. So let's hit that up right now. The spiritual bodily effulgence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is called the Brahma Yotir. And in that Brahma Yotir, there are countless planets. Just as within the sunshine, there are innumerable planets. In the shining effulgences of the body of Krishna, there are innumerable planets and universes. We have knowledge of many universes, and in each universe there is a sun. Thus, there are millions and billions of universes and millions and billions of suns, moons and planets. But Krishna says is that if one tries to go to one of these planets, he will simply waste his time. Oh, bloody hell, Krishna. So what, so what are you saying? You're saying that there's millions and billions of planets for us to explore all over the world, you know, do our thing and have a great time and chill with the lads and millions of suns and the suns are hanging out and all shedding light and it's really great, but it's but in the end it's actually um, just a waste of time <laughs> if you go there. So if you do eventually go to one of these planets, it, it's just a big blooming waste of time, so why even bother? Well, that's a shame. And then I thought you were going to tell us how to go to these planets. Like, well, so you're saying, oh, yeah, go to all these planets if you like, but it will be a waste of time if you do. Come on, man. That's probably why. I mean, why doesn't anyone ever come to this planet? Oh, sounds like something crazy is going on outside. It's probably Krishna after me. I'm in here, dude. Come get me. So let's carry on. <laughs> I mean, this, feels, this sort of feels like a waste of time sometimes, you know. 
is anyone out there listening or am I just talking to myself? I'm, you know, I'm getting better and better. Come on, let's rock with this party. Now someone has gone to the moon, but what will human society gain from it? If, after spending so much money, so much energy and 10 years of effort, one goes to the moon and simply touches it, what is the benefit of that? Can one remain there and call his friends to come? And even if one goes there and remains, what will be the benefit? As long as we are in this material world, either on this planet or other planets, the same miseries, birth, death, old age and disease will follow us. We cannot rid ourselves of them. So it's come full circle, full swing now. So I, I thought when they were talking about these other planets, they were going to be talking about the anti-material world. But no, these planets, these suns and these moons and these orbits and all these kind of stuff are still in the material world. So it's absolutely pointless either way going to them because you're still going to be born, you're still going to die. And that's not the, but the perfect situation as we found out in the first couple of chapters. The anti-material world is a waste of time, dude. So we need to get a bit deeper into this and see what we can find. Turn the page to page 52. If someone wants to buy this book from me, please. It's weighing me down, dude. It's weighing me down. If we go to live on the moon, assuming it is possible, you know, even with an oxygen mask, how long could we stay? Furthermore, even if we had the opportunity to stay there, what would we gain? We might gain a little longer life, perhaps. <laughs> I'm not sure why you might gain longer life from living on the moon. Oh, maybe it's that thing, that inception thing where time, uh, time moves slower. Um, time moves slower when you're out, kind of out of orbit or when you're out of the orbit of... Um, or when you're further away from a gravitational source or something, like time goes slow. I, you know, I did watch um, Interstellar. I, I don't know when this book was made. Um, let's have a quick look here. Book published. Um, I mean, if these guys watched Interstellar, they'd probably be like, ah, that's it, give up the book. Uh, it's a great movie, mate. Uh, it's absolutely changed, changed your life. So it's 2017 edition by... Oh, copyright 1960 and 1970. Yeah, I bet peeps were reading this in the 60s and 70s going, yeah, man. There's a star man waiting in the sky. It's probably Harry Krishna and he's not telling a lie. Uh, something like that. And uh, it's like, you know, they're talking about oxygen masks. They're talking about that. But they don't really, we don't, you know, we haven't been to the moon by this point. So uh, we didn't really find out, find out very much in the end. Uh, it's just a big barren rock uh, with lunar regolith all dispersed upon it and um yeah very interesting very very interesting times okay let's see what's going next in the book of revelations <laughs> sorry about that if that tickled your ears you might gain a little longer life perhaps but we could not live there forever that is impossible and what would we gain by a long life. Tarava Kim Na Jivanti are not the trees living for many, many years. Near San Francisco, I have seen a forest where there is a tree 7,000 years old. But what is the benefit? If one is proud of standing in one place for 7,000 years, that's not very great credit. <laughs> My guy's after trees now. He's saying that trees suck. Come on, man, you can't... Dude, leave the trees alone, man. What is he... What is that? Oh, I wasn't expecting that. He's dissing down trees, man. Dude. And that sucks. Like, how can he... How can he hate on trees, man? Yeah, and it says here, near San Francisco, I've seen a tree. This guy reading this and writing this is uh, probably some from San Francisco. I know they were getting into a lot of that old spiritual malarkey. Quite a few years ago, you know, dropping a few acid tabs, creating a few technological innovations and marvels, and then, um, and then all of a sudden, the rest of the world is creating AI. Thirty years later, and then this guy's dissing down trees, and like, oh come on, man, I love trees. Trees are like so cool. Like if a tree's been there for seven thousand years, that's something to be proud of. You'd be like, that is a sick tree. No one's touched it for seven thousand. 
That's a long time, man. I know in this guy's world, millions and billions of years pass it all the time in an anti-material world, but what about Okie Doke? Do you guys know, you guys know Okie Doke? Um, I don't know what, what his actual age is. Uh, let's have a quick look at Okie Doke age. I don't know if we're really going to find out his age. He's, he's pretty timeless, to be honest with you. He's a, he's a kind of spiritual being, I guess, uh, that lives in a tree. He's made from the tree. And then when animals get into trouble and danger, what he does is he pops himself out and then um and then he helps the animals uh kind of solve their moral and ethical issues. Let's see if we can play a bit of the music from um on my phone here. Okie doke theme. And now this is what I'm talking about. This is my kind of meditation. I don't know about anyone else, but let's play this boy. The problem and you need a helping hand Cause the devil in the belly will understand For he does, he comes okie doke The friendliest of folks, he's Mr. Okie doke Now, I don't know about you, but that's vibes that speaks to me in uh, in ways that uh, I couldn't even uh, describe to you, right? So let's let's get over this tree hating business once and for all, and carry on into the varieties of planetary systems. How one goes to the moon, how he comes back, etc., is a great story, and this is all described in the Vedic literature. It is not a very new process. But the aim of our Krishna Consciousness Society is different. We're not going to waste our valuable time, Krishna says. Don't waste your time attempting to go to this planet or to that planet. What will you gain? Your material miseries will follow you wherever you go. Therefore, in the Katiyamnya Kariyamanatara, it is very nicely said by the author, In this material world, Someone is enjoying and someone is not enjoying. But actually, everyone is suffering. Although some people think that they are enjoying, whereas others realise that they are suffering, actually, everyone is suffering. Who in this material world does not suffer disease? Who does not suffer from old age? Who does not die? No one wants to grow old or suffer from disease, but everyone must do so. Where is the enjoyment? That's very sad, actually. Poor guys. I do feel really sad about that. I guess we are all suffering in our own ways. We've all got our own trials and tribulations. Does anyone out there have a perfect life? If you do, please uh, message in. I've got a, a few home truths to ruin your uh, <laughs> ruin your evening. No, I don't, I don't have anything. I always try and spread the joy. Spreading joy brings joy, I think. Um, you can't spread joy to just to receive joy. You must give it holy and and never expect anything back and then the universe will repay you that's not in the book by the way and yeah i guess we are all suffering and you know one can suffer from disease or old age and no one wants to grow old and suffer and i guess you know what else can we do it's getting very deep this podcast today um if you if you're feeling this podcast obviously you can check me out it's mitch wade cole here Instagram forward slash Mitch Wade Cole, Facebook.com forward slash Mitch Wade Cole, and all of the Mitch Wade Coles. If you put my name into most platforms, you'll find me and I'll be there waiting for you. With another lovely, lovely book and spiritual advice. So let's carry on that then. Hoi! This enjoyment is all nonsense because within this material world, there is no enjoyment. Oh no, yet there is a bit of enjoyment. It is simply our imagination. One should not think, this is enjoyment and this is suffering. And everything is suffering. Therefore it is stated in the Katnyanya Karimatra, the principles of eating, sleeping, mating and defending will always exist. But they will exist in different standards. For example, the Americans have taken birth in America as 
a result of pious activities performed in previous lifetimes. In India, the people are poverty stricken and are suffering. But although the Americans are eating very nicely buttered bread and the Indians are eating without butter, they are both eating nonetheless. Okay, so what they're trying to say here is um, someone's eating, someone isn't eating. In America, they eat a lot, and then there's a lot of poverty in India, but at least they're both eating. And then, and then maybe, I don't know if India eats, but do they like, you know, because of the cows and stuff like that, are they allowed to milk a cow? This is all information that I need to find out, and hopefully this book will deliver. The fact that India is poverty-stricken has not caused the whole population to die for want of food. The four principal bodily demands, eating, sleeping, mating and defending, can be satisfied under any circumstances. Whether one is born in an impious condition or in a pious condition, the problem, however, is how to become free from the four principles of birth, death, old age and disease. This is the real problem. It is not, what shall I eat? The birds and beasts have no such problem. In the morning, they are immediately chirping, g g g g. They know that they will have their food. No one is dying, and there is no such thing as overpopulation, as everyone is provided for by God's arrangement. There are qualitative differences, Obtaining a superior quality of material enjoyment is not the end of life. Yeah, so I guess we were just talking about that. Some, you know, everyone's sort of suffering. So even like, you know, your Kanye West and your millionaires, Bill Gates, and all kinds of people are all all suffering at one point or the other. You know, you might lose a friend or a family member, or it's all relative, isn't it? So like, they might be sort of stricken by I don't know like all sorts of kinds of stuff um, you know they might have lost a lot of money but to them in you know, comparison they might still have some money that's more than everyone else but you know maybe they're not as popular as they thought they were and that can you know it still cause like it's like oh woe is me but you know it can still cause a bit of um, headaches and sleepless nights can't it so let's carry on the real problem isn't what shall I eat the birds and beasts have no such problem. But there are qualitative differences. The real problem is how to get free of birth, death, old age and disease. This cannot be solved by simply wasting time travelling within the universe. Because our life is short, you know, our life's too short to be travelling around the universe and that, that happens in Interstellar as well. Is this, is this the plot of Interstellar? It looks like Interstellar to me. Um, yeah, so like you can start they're travelling around the universe and time's going faster on Earth and it's going slower and and wherever they are and all this kind of mad thing. Yeah, it's really, really, really hard to get your head around, isn't it, basically? But yeah, um again it comes back to this birth, death, old age and disease, and this is what they really, really want to get away from. They hate that. That's the material world. So let's have a look. Even if one goes to the highest planet. This problem cannot be solved. For well, there is death everywhere. The duration of life on the moon, according to the Vedic information, is 10,000 years. And one day, there is equal to six months here. Whoa! So the duration of life on the moon, according to the Vedic information, is 10,000 years. And one day, there is equal to six months here. Okay, according to the Vedic literature, I'm pretty sure that Neil Armstrong didn't, like... Like, he went off to the moon and then he came back, like, I don't know, like five years later, but it only aged five days. <laughs> that seems a bit crazy. Um, not crazy, just scientifically inaccurate to what it is, I think, is reasonable. <laughs> okay, so let's see what else they've got to say. Thus, 10,000 multiplied by 180 years is the duration of life on the moon. However, it is impossible for Earthmen to go to the moon and live there for a very long time, 
otherwise the whole Vedic literature will be false. We can attempt to go there, but it is not possible to live there. This knowledge is in the Vedas. Therefore, we are not very eager to go to this planet or that planet. We are eager to go directly to the planet where Krishna lives. Krishna states in the Bhagavad Gita, one can go to the moon, or one can even go to the sun or to millions and trillions of other planets. Or if one is too materially attached, he may remain there. But those who are my devotees will come to me. Yeah, so get rid of the sun. Who cares about the sun? Who cares about these trillions and planets? The real peeps are going to be coming straight to, to Krishna or whatever this dude's name is. The all attractive one, or what this dude's, what this guy is, they're going to be going straight to him, and it's going to be party time from there. Party at five, uh, yeah. Uh, they're going to have a bloody grand one, I guess. And um, yeah, I think that's that makes sense. So he's just like, forget all these other planets, bruv. Just come, come suckle on my bosom if you can. In your, um, it's a good job no one listens to this podcast. Maybe when I get cancelled, maybe everyone will go back through this. Hey guys, Mitch here from uh, Post Cancellation. Um, yep, yeah, yes, uh, you have found me talking about cultures that are not my own. And uh, yeah, just hope, hope that uh, you, you're getting the gist of what I'm trying to say. There's probably a lot of quotes in there and a lot of mispronunciations that you can use as ammo. So here we rock one more time into the spirit of consciousness. This is our aim. Initiation to Krishna consciousness ensures that the student ultimately can go to the supreme planet, Karasamaloka. We are not sitting idly. We are also attempting to go to other planets, but we are not merely wasting time. A sane and intelligent man does not wish to enter any of the material planets because the four conditions of material miseries exist on all of them. From the Bhagavad Gita, we can understand that even if we enter Brahmaloka, the highest planetary system of this universe, the four principles of misery will be present. We learn from Bhagavad Gita that the duration of one day on Brahmaloka is millions of years of our calculation. That is a fact. That is a fact. So, uh, the highest planetary system of this universe, the four principles of misery will be present. Oh, that's birth, life, death, and old age. What was it called? Um, we learn from the Bhagavad Gita that the duration of one day on Brahma Loka is millions of years of our calculation. Okay, that's fine because you know what? When they started talking about the moon like that, that was a bit different. But um, just getting a bit of a doorbell. I hope it's not Krishna. And here we are back, carrying on. So, a sane and intelligent man does not wish to enter any of the material planets because the four conditions of material miseries exist on all of them. From the Bhagavad Gita, we can understand that even if we enter Brahmaloka, the highest planetary system of this universe, the four principal mysteries, miseries will be present. Do you remember that? Birth, life, death, old age, the moon, trees. Even the highest planetary system, Ramaloka, may be reached. But scientists say that it will take 40,000 years at Sputnik speed. Wait, wait where is this place? What, what's this place? Uh, Brahma, Brahma Loka. What is this a planet that we've... What? Wait, scientists are saying it's going to take that long. How do... I've never heard of this planet. Brahma Loka. Brahma Pura. Cool. Brahma Loka is the abode of goddess Sawa... Saraswati, goddess Gayatri, and Lord Brahma, the creator god and the part dream. Blah, 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 blah. Where is it? Oh man, these guys are getting deep. Where? Where is Vacant Infinite? 
26,000 Yojana above Satya Loka, known as Brahma Loka, the location of Vega coincidences. Anyway, no one knows where it's located. Oh, oh, they say it's located in the Capricorn constellation. Hindu cosmology. <laughs> this is wicked. <laughs> I quite like that. I quite like the sound of that. Hindu cosmology. Right, sick. In Hindu cosmology, the universe is cyclically created and destroyed. Its cosmology divides time into four epochs. Uh, description, according to Hindu Vedic cosmology, there is no absolute start time. It is considered infinite and cyclic. Similarly, the space and universe has neither a start nor an end. Rather, it is cyclical. The current universe is just the start of a present cycle preceded by an infinite number of universes and to be followed by another infinite number of universes. Cool, great. Right, I'm getting into that now. So just to come full circle there after that big kind of tangent off, um, they, they say that, it, that it's going to take Sputnik. So this, remember, this is the 60s and 70s that I just found out this book was made. It's going to take Sputnik, Sputnik itself 40,000 years uh, to get there. But he wears Sputnik these days. Sputnik must be on a mad one, dude. Man, I'm... Getting pure throwback vibes here. I'm reading the book and it's making me think of all the other kind of cool things that are going on in the world. Anyone remember Sputnik? Sputnik was like the big bad boy of space air, uh, spacecraft that went into um uh, that went into space. Where is it now? Where's Sputnik now? After about three months, Sputnik fell into the air atmosphere. Oh, oh, so Sputnik was just like. It's just a satellite. I thought it went off like the Voyager thing that went like past the um, Mars and stuff, and I'm just going out into the uh, into space, basically. Poor guy. So let's just carry on with this uh, with the book itself before I get too crazy. From the Vedic literature, we can understand that we can enter any of the planets, provided we prepare for that purpose. If one prepares himself to enter into the higher planetary systems which are said to be inhabited by demigods. Fuck. If one prepares himself to enter into the higher planetary systems, which are said to be inhabited by demigods, he can go there. Similarly, one can go to a lower planetary system, or if one desires, he can remain on this planet. Finally, if one desires, he can enter the planet of the Supreme Person Personality of Godhead. It is all a matter of preparation. However, all planetary systems within our material universe are temporary. Ah, yes, yeah, so that's back into the old material world, being a temporary world, of birth, life, and death, and reincarnation. Ah, I mean, I wouldn't like to go up to Jupiter and say it's temporary. <laughs> Otherwise, he'll probably just smack me around the head and grab me by the ankles, tip me upside down, and steal my lunch money. The duration of life on certain material planets may be very long, but all living entities in the material universe are eventually subject to annihilation and have to, do, have to again develop other bodies. There are different types of bodies. A human body exists 100 years, whereas an insect body may exist for 12 hours. Thus, the duration of these bodies is relative. If one enters the planet called Vaikutha Loka, the spiritual planet, however, he then achieves eternal life, full of bliss and knowledge. So not only do you get a bit of eternal life, full of, you know, bliss, knowledge, I'm at a great time, you also get to live forever. So why are we even here on this material world? Is it some sort of test? Is it you know, a kind of trial that we need to do before, you know, we were allowed to get up there. I mean, there's so many different questions that this book answers and um, confounds. Just to kind of go off the subject a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit, now that we're deep into the podcast and no one's listening, tell you a little bit about my next venture. Um, I'm going to be doing a podcast or a radio show based on... Uh, fan fiction so just reading through fan fiction trying to navigate it trying to you know have a laugh find out what's going on um 
some of it is mental. And we're not we're not trying to poke fun. It's just like there's these wor- there's these books and these words out there, and whether they're grammatically incorrect or bizarre or out there or whatever, they obviously wrote these stories to be shared with the world. So, kind of amplifying these um, stories, I think should have quite positive effects, and then hopefully. Um, Hopefully people will latch on, get on it, and yeah, they can feel the vibe as well. I've read a few of them, and I'm going to tell you they are very, very interesting. Uh, some Sonic ones and Mario ones. So let's get back into the Godhead. Finally, if one desires, he can enter the planet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is all a matter of preparation. However, all planetary systems within our material universe are temporary. A human being can attain that perfection if he tries. That is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, when the Lord says, Anyone who knows in truth about the Supreme Personality of the Godhead can attain to my nature. Many people claim, God is great. But this is a hackneyed phrase. Or hack and hack... Yeah, hackneyed phrase. Oi. I live near Hackney. That's a hackneyed phrase. What's wrong with Hackney? This guy is dissing down trees, dissing down Hackneyed. Hackneyed means having has been overused, unoriginal or trite. So he's saying when like people would say Ayu Akbar, God is great, that's that's Hackneyed, it's overused, it's unoriginal and it's trite. Bloody hell man, this guy is ruthless. He's ripping through the material world like I don't know some sort of tsunami. Let's find out a bit more. One must know how he is great, and that that can be known from authorized scripture. It has to be signed off. In the Bhagavad Gita, God describes himself. He says, My appearance of taking birth just like an ordinary human being is actually transcendental. God is so kind that he comes before us as an ordinary human being but his body is not exactly like a human being. My bad is telling me you. Um, yeah, so he couldn't. So he looks like a human, you know, just to probably to not freak us out too much. You know, if he, he comes in some other way, we'd probably be like, "Well, this is this guy's a bit of a freaky freak, freaky minx." <laughs> what am I talking about? But he looks a bit human. I've seen him. He's kind of like looks. He's got like blue skin and stuff like that, but. Yeah, he plays a flute. There's a few cool dances and has a, a peacock's feather in his hat. Um, yeah, so his body is not exactly human. Those rascals who do not know about him think that Krishna is like one of us. That is also stated in the Bhagavad Gita. Fools deride me when I descend in the human form. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominium over all that be. We have a chance to know about Krishna, provided we read the right literature under the right direction and we simply know what the nature of God is. Then we understand this one fact alone, we become liberated. It is not possible in our human condition to understand the absolute supreme personality of Godhead completely. But with the help of Bhagavad Gita, the statement given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead and of the Spiritual Master, we can know him to the best of our capacity. All right, so yeah, the Absolute Supreme Personality of Godhead is just like, he's just, a, he's, he's that dude. He's the um, uh, the guy, oh, what was he? he's just like the guy that's kind of, he's a normal person. Uh, absolute Personality of Godhead, I'm just searching it here. He's the dude who's just a normal guy but is like the head of this sort of religion and he's all like yo 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 um you think i'm just a normal dude but oh you don't know how transcendental i am like behind the scenes i ask my mates i'm well transcendental wait till i get down the pub i'm like a complete different person than i I am at work you know after about a few pints everyone's like you're a legend you're you're an absolute supreme personality i've got it i don't know who he is at the moment uh, no, he's not on here. I thought he might have a Twitter account. No, nothing there. That's a shame. 
So let's find out a little bit more. And we can find out a lot more about them if we open our minds. Open your mind. And let's rock this party. If we can know him in reality, then immediately after leaving his body, we can enter into the kingdom of God. Krishna says, I'm not going to pronounce that. After leaving this body, one who is in knowledge does not come again to this material world, for he enters into the spiritual world and comes to me. The purpose of our Krishna consciousness movement is to propagate this advanced scientific idea to people in general, and the process is very simple. Simply by chanting the holy names of God, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One cleanses the dirt from his heart and gains understanding that he is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord and that it is his duty to serve him. This process is very pleasant. We chant the Hare Krishna mantra, we dance rhythmically and we eat nice prasada. That's what I mean, like, this kind of stuff, like, uh, you know, you've got a complex life, you're making podcasts, you're doing videos, you're trying to get to work, you know, you got your girlfriend, you got all these things that you're trying to juggle. What if you could just say, hey, no, I'm going to wear a bloody orange robe, chant Hare Krishna, Krishna, like get into a meditative state, dance rhythmically, and then just eat some bloody lovely food. That's your life. You're doing that every day. Like, that would be bloody sick, man. I'd love that. Just simplify it all. Dude, man, why can't I do that? Mate, hey, I'm going to give these guys a call, actually. I'm definitely indoctrinated now. This is not fabrication, as he say, he goes on to say. This is not a fabrication. It is all factual. Although to a layman this appears to be a fabrication, Krishna reveals himself from within to one who is serious about God realization. Both Krishna and the spiritual master help the sincere soul. The spiritual master is the ex external manifestation of God who is situated in everyone's heart as the super soul. For one who is very serious about understanding the supreme personality of Godhead, the super soul immediately renders assistance by directing him to a bona fide spiritual master. In this way, the spiritual candidate is helped from within and without. Really not sure what that's trying to tell me here. I've, I've read a lot and nothing actually really went in there. Everyone's heart as the super soul. Right. According to the Bhagavad Purana, which is like probably some completely different kind of Bhagavad, um, the supreme truth is realized in three stages. First, there is an impersonal Brahman, or the impersonal absolute. Then the Paramatma, or localized aspect of the Brahman. The neutron of the atom may be taken as the representation of Paramatatma, who also enters into the atom. This is described in the Brahma Samhita, but ultimately the Supreme Divine Being is realized as the Supreme All-Attractive Person. <laughs> I can't get over when it's called him a Supreme All-Attractive Person, because I guess he's got attractive qualities more in terms of magnetism than it is in terms of he's like a really great face. With full and inconceivable potencies of opulences, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. So no, it is, it is his face. It was it 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 was his face. These six potencies are fully exhibited by Sri Rama and Sri Krishna when they descend before human beings. Only a section of human beings, the unalloyed devotees, can recognize Krishna on the authority of revealed scriptures. But others are bewildered by the influence of material energy. Yep, I was kind of bewildered, to be honest with you. Maybe that's me. Oh, God, you know, maybe I should get yoga going on. Everyone's just a bit of yoga these days, aren't they? Oh, 
Unless it's, maybe I can make my own version. Yawn yoga. It's far too early for me at this point in time. But I've got a cup of tea here. How much have we got left? Oh, I'm out of tea. That's what's going on. But, you know, I do love a good cup of tea. It's a lovely, lovely dish. Best served warm. But others are bewildered by the influence of material energy. The absolute truth is therefore the absolute person, who is no equal or competitor. The impersonal Brahman rays are the rays of his transcendental body, just as the sun rays are emanations from the sun. <laughs> so, rays are the rays of his transcendental body, just as sun rays are emanations from the sun. So, the sun, he, the sun's his eye, and unlike a normal eye where the light rays go into his eye, uh, the rays go out of the sun and they are his body. So you work that one out, guys. It's a little bit like uh, Jesus says, give us today our daily bread, which is, you know, delicious and probably extremely tasty. This is different. This is some other thing that we can mess around with. Let's have a look. Some rays and emanations from the body sun. According to this new Purana, material energy is called Avidaya or Nay Science and is exhibited in the fruitive activities of sense enjoyment. But although the living being has a tendency to be illusioned and trapped by the material energy for sense enjoyment, he belongs to the antimaterial energy or spiritual energy. The rest of us are trapped by illusions and he is uh, free to roam in the spiritual body of the eternal. And we're in a world of illusion, material energy. He's in the antimaterial energy where everything's good and you can live forever and like have infinite knowledge. I don't get what this infinite knowledge is. Like, what, what, how much knowledge can you get? I mean, what, you, get, you know everything in the world, right? Then what? Boom, you know, you've known everything in the world and then that's it. Well, that's good, isn't it? Well done. You have won this round. Matter does not develop unless in contact with a superior spiritual or anti-material, which is directly part and parcel of the spiritual whole. The subject matter of this spiritual energy exhibited by living beings is undoubtedly very complicated for an ordinary man who is therefore astounded by the subject. Hey, hands up, I'm an ordinary man here, completely astounded by the complexities of this. I, I didn't really find it that complex, would it you? I find it sort of baffling. Like, there's a lot of... Um, big leaps of faith here and there's a lot of uh, jumping to conclusions and you know big words and you know a lot a lot that you just have to take in and a lot of language that um i don't quite understand um is it complicated though no i think i've kind of spelled out exactly what i think each bit means and what that means to the actual normal person and what their kind of world of perception is so Sometimes he partially understands it through the imperfect senses, and sometimes he fails to know it altogether. Okay, that might be me, or maybe I'm just partially understanding it through my... What is it? Imperfect senses. Oh, come on, I know my eyesight's going, my smell's not what it used to be, but, you know, it's not. I'm not imperfect. It is best, therefore, to hear from the highest authority, Sri Krishna, or from his devotee who represents him in the chain of... Disciplic succession. Who's that? Maybe I've got one down the road. This Krishna consciousness movement is meant to be for the purpose of understanding God. The spiritual master is a living representation of Krishna who helps externally, and Krishna, as a super soul, helps internally. The living entity can take advantage of such guidance and makes his life successful. We request that everyone read authoritative literature in order to understand this movement. We have published Bhagavad Gita as it is, teachings of Lord Katyana, Srimad Bhagavataram, Krishna, the Supreme Person of God, the Personality of Godhead, and the Nectar of Devotion. Hey, these guys are busy, busy bees. We're busy, busy beats. 
Um, so a few books there, but some extra reading for you when I leave you after this to do my new venture, which is a podcast about, or a podcast, a radio show about uh, fan fiction, which should be bloody hilarious, hopefully. Um, hopefully. I've read a bit of it. It is it's bloody mental. We're also publishing our magazine, Back to Godhead. <laughs> it's like a, a sequel. Bhagavad Krishna, the personality divine. Back to Godhead. <laughs> Krishna 2, Back to Godhead. <laughs> Every month in many languages. Our mission is to save human society from the pitfalls of incarnating again in the cycle of birth and death. What do you mean? What, you want me to be... You don't want me to bang? It's like what they say, and they're saying, don't bang. We want you to save yourself from the cycle, become a nun or a monk. Don't bang, and then you'll save yourself from the cycle by just, you know, not passing on your seed. So is that is that okay for 11 to 12 o'clock? Everyone should attempt to go to Krishna. We have published an article in our Back to Godhead magazine entitled Beyond the Universe. This article describes a place beyond this universe according to knowledge, which is in the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a very popular book, and there are many editions of it in America, and also many from India. Many, many editions. Unfortunately, however, many rascals have come to the West to preach the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, you bloody rascals! we got to stop these guys, guys. Guys, we've got to stop these guys. We can't let these rascals come and ruin our, ruin our stuff. Uh, where are these rascals? Where are these rascals? I'm trying to find them. There they are. They are designated as rascals because they are bluffers who do not give real information. In our bag of it is, it is, however, the spiritual nature is authoritatively described. Not by these rascals. This cosmic manifestation is called nature. But there is another nature which is superior. The cosmic manifestation of inferior nature. Oh. But beyond this nature, which is manifested and unmanifested, there is another nature which is called Santanana. Eternal. It is easy to understand that everything manifested here is temporary. The obvious example is our body. Yeah, it is. Te- it is sort of temporary, isn't it? Our bodies. My body is telling me it's temporary. If one is 30 years old, oh no, I'm 30 years old. If one is 30 years old, 30 years ago his body was not manifested. That's true. And in another 50 years it will again be unmanifested. That's true. That is a factual law of nature. That's true. It is manifested again, annihilated, just as waves in the sea rise frequently and recede. Not, not sure how true that is. The materialist, however, is simply concerned with the mortal life which can be finished at any moment. That's true. Furthermore, as this body will die, so the entire universe, this gigantic material body, will be annihilated. And whether we are fortunate or unfortunate on this planet or any of or another planet, everything will be finished, finished, finished. It's all going to be over, guys. Uh, just like this podcast, episode three. I guess the reason why I decided to stop it was it just I kind of underestimated how repetitive this book might be. I, you know, if no one's feeling it, why well, keep beating on the same drum? Let's switch it up. Let's do something that's exciting. Um, and you guys can check out the rest of this book in your own time. Send me a text if you want because um, uh, I can help you out and we can uh, sort something out. So we can have a look at a bit of a glossary here, just to switch it up um, for the final minute. So, and that is it. We're almost there. Aspara prakti, inferior, inferior material energy. Astanga yoga, the materialistic art of controlling the airs of the body for transferring to a planet. And avidya nissans, nissans. That's it for me, guys. 
I'm going to catch you next month. Uh, make sure to check me out on all the uh, social media platforms if you are listening in. It's Mitch Wade Cole. Instagram, Mitch Wade Cole. Facebook, MWCFB. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be doing my new fan fiction radio show, which I think you're going to like. I'm going to, I'm going to film that as well so that I can maybe start up a new YouTube channel. Uh, where it's like more concise and there's only and there's one subject because that's what's very important these days is so when you create a YouTube channel you're going to make sure that it's concise on one subject so people know what to expect from your channel don't branch out too much always cross promote to other channels and do it well thank you so much again Fred um, it's been emotional and I'll catch you on the other side on the anti-material side in the future rock on peace out